Someone must have left. Let me see if the store can be in the place. Destroying the evidence. Go ahead. These were all empty. I have put down this. Now I think it's actually someplace else. Someone from the audience dumped it there. That's me. That's me. Good evening and welcome to the, the January 29th, 2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please call the roll? Mr. Dupree? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Ms. Oglis? Here. Thank you. Uh, next item is approval of minutes from the January 8, 2018 meeting. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Robin? I have a couple of amendments. Um, one is regarding item oh, regarding Scarborough Downs. Um, the, the western side of the watershed is called Willowdale Brook. And uh, I'd like to add that I pointed out that Millbrook is proposed to be threatened. And um, lastly, on page 6 of 10, um, where it says Ms. Saunders stated it is important to protect the area watersheds, I'd like to add that it said, and ask that the developer participate in any watershed management planning efforts, and the applicant agreed. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'll amend my motion to include Ms. Summers' comments. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, Black Point Holdings LLC requests a site plan review for a new multi-tenant building at 20 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map U43, Lot 11. Would you like to introduce this one, Jay? Sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you just noted, this is a site plan application for the uh, prior site of uh, was the Widow Walk, um, which many folks may remember here in town. Um, this is in the TVC2 district, and the applicant is proposing to redevelop the site with a medical office building. Um, actually, that's one of the sort of critical distinctions that um, is worth talking about is the use of the, of the building. Um, as board members remember, uh, recall, this was before you for a sketch plan a few months ago, and at that time we really talked about the board expressed some concerns um, with the access, and the applicants really looked to um, utilize an existing easement with the abutting uh, assisted living uh, facility. Um, that actually, the easement was secured as part of that application review process, um, site plan application review process, and so the applicant is seeking to, to make uh, use of that for access management purposes, but that is one of the things to talk about, and, and the reason I bring that up in terms of use is really um, it, the um, traffic engineer uh, program is really designed around a medical office use and we want to be sure in, in the narrative there was a suggestion of maybe some expanded uses beyond that and just want to be sure we, we have a good understanding of exactly what those um, activities are going to be. Um, again, because traffic was one of those items that the board had talked about. And there's also um, the applicant is seeking for a little larger parking uh, uh, field than is typically required by our ordinances, but again, that's something the board will usually look at and, and try to determine based on the uses. And I think with that, what I'll ask is actually if uh, uh, Angela can chime in and, and touch on some of the detail on those detailed issues. And before we throw it over to Angela, um, I believe staff received architectural plans uh, just a few days ago. Is that right? I believe it was Thursday yeah. afternoon. Okay. It was. Okay. So I'll. I'll just suggest that for the board and the applicant that given that those were received after the deadline, we haven't had a chance to look at those, and given that there are plenty of other things to talk about that we try and focus on stormwater access and some of those other things that are, that are on the table and sort of focus on that um, given, given constraints there. So I'll hand it over to you, Angela. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the traffic and the site access, just to, to continue what Jay was, was pointing out. Um, what, uh, Goral Palmer did our, our traffic peer review, and really the focus is around that left turn lane out on Black Point Road, and whether that really has the capacity where that shared access is. What was um, determined is that they were, the applicant is, is showing that they have adequate capacity, um, as long as, the traffic coming up Black Point Road is not blocking the entrance itself, um, which is where the signage comes in. And so that's pointed out, and it is on the plan um, regarding that piece of it. So really what Goral Palmer's memo um, talks about is that, in their opinion, it's really the functionality of Oak Hill intersection, which is why we have our traffic impact fees to look at larger scoped projects like tackling Oak Hill. Um, for instead of having you know smaller projects coming through having to deal with such a large task so really I guess I would ask the board to kind of focus around um, when Black Point Road does get queued up down to Winnix Neck which I know we talked about in previous meetings really how does this site really impact that and how um, this specific site and how they get in and out of, of the site and kind of really focus on that rather than Oak Hill as a whole. Um, and then just as far as stormwater goes, this is a redevelopment site. So how the um, state and our local ordinance kind of looks at it as um, a lower permitting threshold. So stormwater permit for this is only a, a permit by rule um, because they are increasing impervious area, but not to the thresholds that would trigger a larger permit process. And um, I do understand the, the sensitivity about where this um, 
how they're maxing out really the site and where the stormwater facilities are close proximity to property lines. So what I had asked the applicant to do, which they did provide in the packet, is going beyond our typical 25 year storm event is what we design these systems to typically. Um, they have provided information for a 100 year storm event, which um, typically we look at that as saying, um, we don't really design to completely capture that 100 year, but show us that it doesn't impact significantly around it. And actually what they're showing, and, and I'm sure Nancy will speak to this, is that even in the 100 year storm event, the, um, the water level does not trigger going over the spillways, which is right in proximity to the property lines surrounding them. So um, that's just something to note that staff was aware of that the concerns that might come up because of the proximity of those, those features. And then um, I think Jay might have mentioned about the um, parking, um, the additional parking than what the ordinance required. So I just want to point that out and how that fits into stormwater. Obviously, the more impervious area, the more volume of water coming off the site. Um, the applicant is showing that they're meeting pre-development conditions for the flow rate but wherever you add impervious area, you're adding volume of water off the site. So this might be something that I can talk to a little bit more if anyone has questions. And um, the last thing is that I should point out is that this does trigger our post-construction ordinance. So there is uh, requirements on the site to do um, inspection, maintenance, and annual reporting to the town so that these facilities would have to be maintained and that gets reported to our office. All right, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. I have actually quite a large team with me here tonight, so I want to take just a moment to sort of outline our presentation for you folks, and I think that as part of that sort of stepped process, a lot of the questions and comments that have been discussed so far will hopefully um, add some clarity to them. So first of all, Dr. Stuart Kerr is here, he's in the audience. He is the applicant representing uh, Black Point Holdings, LLC. And as we've mentioned to you folks in our application materials, the anchor within this building is actually the new home for Scarborough Family Chiropractic. So their facility, which is on Route 1 right now, will move over to here. It will be a little bit larger, but the same types of services that are offered there uh, will be offered here as well. There's some additional space in the building that would have uh, an opportunity for a couple more tenants in that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. So as Jay mentioned, uh, this is the old Widow's Walk site. I think it was back in uh, 2013, maybe, time frame. Uh, the building was, and the barn was torn down. Uh, so the site is uh, currently unimproved. And uh, as Jay mentioned, we were before you folks actually in July of 2017 with a sketch plan. That sketch plan had a little bit larger building. Uh, and if the folks who were here during that time uh, may recall, we had sort of a loop circulation pattern through the site. So the connection that you see on the northerly end of the site, um, which is right here, that's the same location that we had originally. But we actually had an in and out, right in, right out, basically opposite Thornton Road. Uh, as we've gone through the process and working with staff and reviewing uh, the traffic circulation patterns and um, access along uh, Black Point Road, that was eliminated and the plan that you see before you uh, is the end result. So uh, as I mentioned, we have worked with staff in the interim and it has taken a, a bit of time, but that is because we've done quite a bit of evaluation, particularly with regard to traffic. And so Bill Bray is here tonight uh, to speak to you folks about traffic, and I'll turn it over to him in just a, a couple of minutes. We also have Keith Smith here with uh, Terry DeWan's office to talk to you folks about landscaping and lighting uh, as proposed on the site. And we also have Deirdre Pio, who is with Garin Turgeon Architects, who's the project architect. And I do understand that you received uh, the building renderings late in the process and we're not asking for a formal deliberation, but we did want to introduce them to you uh, to give you a feel for what we're looking at uh, as part of the site improvements. So as I mentioned, the building's a bit smaller. The current building is now 8,776 square feet. 
Uh, the Scarborough Family Chiropractic will take just a little under 5,000 square feet of that space, leaving um, about 37, 3,800 square feet for a couple of other tenants. So they're not, it's not a tremendously large uh, space that would be available. We do expect that the tenant selection would be someone that would be comparable or complementary to uh, the existing uh, center so that, you know, as we noted in our uh, application materials, it could be a medical office, professional service, that type of thing. But again, we wanted to make sure that our trip generation that is associated with our analysis is still consistent with that. So any tenants that would come in would have to be consistent with what we had made for assumptions on trip generation for that. Parking has another comment that was made. Uh, we are proposing 53 parking spaces on the site. That's based on a parking ratio of about six spaces per thousand, uh, which is in excess of the ordinance minimums, uh, which would require about 36 spaces for this size building. The reason for that is that the applicant has worked with his broker and wanted to be able to provide sufficient parking for tenants that would be comparable to his type of use. And so with that, uh, we are uh, asking that the ratio be at six spaces per thousand square feet. That um, will allow us to take care of parking on site for both the chiropractic center and any tenant space. And keep aware of the fact that given the location, we don't have access to on-site parking, on-street parking, excuse me. We don't have access to any shared parking on any other adjacent facilities either. So this is, we do need to have the site be a standalone uh, with regard to parking. We want to make sure that it is inviting for tenants uh, to be able to lease this space uh, and have a fully occupied building. <coughs> so one of the things that we uh, also wanted to talk to you about is stormwater. And we have done a analysis of the site. As Angela mentioned, we looked at the pre-development conditions and the post-development conditions. And there's a bunch of different standards that need to be met. You folks are aware of it, but not perhaps not everyone in the audience is, is aware sort of the process. But there's in stormwater there's basically two different categories. There's quantity, which is referred to at the state level as the flooding standard. And that's looking at pre-development peak discharge rates and post-development discharge rates. We did that analysis as part of our uh, efforts. The other piece of it is quality, and that provides treatment, whether that's thermal benefits, uh, gluten removals, those types of things. So there's two different categories that would fall into play. As Angela correctly noted, given the uh, relatively small size of this site at the state level, the only requirements that we trigger are for what's called a permit by rule for stormwater, which is a 14-day review period. And that review focuses on erosion and sediment control, housekeeping, maintenance, those types of things. The water quality aspect of this project is not triggered at the state level, nor is the flooding standard triggered at the state level. However, as part of our local review, we did also consider what's the flooding standard, as well as providing some treatment on the site. So our program for stormwater looks at controlling the peak rate of discharge and for treating a portion of the site. Roughly about 50% of the impervious area has a water quality treatment best management practice. The entire rooftop of the building will have a roof drip line BMP, so runoff that comes off the drip edges of the building actually is collected in a stone reservoir area along the face of the building. That reservoir drains by an under drain and actually connects into our pipe system uh, as part of that. So the treatment for the runoff associated with the rooftop is included in that BMP. The uh, easterly parking area, which is right here, there's a catch basin right in the lower corner there that actually collects the runoff from that. Could you turn that so we can show it? Because I can see that one, but I can't see where you put the little dog. Thank you. Can everybody see that? So that catch basin that I mentioned is right in that corner there. That Jay's catch basin. Pointing, sorry, Jay's pointing to it with the cursor on the, on the screen, too, just for those who yeah. are generally right. watching Excellent. from elsewhere. Thanks. Excellent. I don't think I need. Ooh, I can get to that one. I can't get to those screens, but I'll work on that one. <clears throat> so that catch basin that's in that 
the lower corner right there. Right in this corner here on the site, right in there, is what's called a grass under drain soil filter. It is a treatment facility, if you will. It's from the outside looks like a, just a depressional area within a lawn. But what it does underground is it provides treatment for the runoff that is leaving that portion of the parking area. So that treatment does two things. One, it provides that water quality benefit that we talked about. But it also has, in addition to that, an available storage capacity to help control that peak flow rate leaving the site. So that's a piece of our stormwater management for that. And as Angela noted, we evaluated that. We're typically obligated to uh, design for the 210 and the 25 year storm and demonstrate that we're meeting our requirements for that. But in looking at that facility, one of the things we also wanted to understand was if it goes beyond a 25 year storm event, what does the water surface elevation look like in the context of that spillway that you see? Um, can you go to the grading tent? Here we go. Right there. <clears throat> so that spillway is an emergency spillway. It's designed to function when the system has uh, re reached its capacity. In the 100-year storm event, our water surface is six inches below that. So we still don't even get to that emergency spillway in a 100-year storm event. That's an event that happens with a 1% chance of happening in a year. And that represents about eight inches of rain uh, that's happening in a year. Actually, subsequent to our meeting uh, with Angela, I actually took the system to a 500-year storm event to see what would happen with our system in that uh, time frame. Now, that's a two-tenths of a percent chance of it happening. And in a 500-year storm event, we've got less than an inch over the top of that spillway. So that's a 500-year storm event, and that's 12.1 inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period for that. So that's taking it well past the 25-year storm uh, requirement for that. So as I mentioned, that's one piece. So that's treatment and attenuation. The other piece of it is underneath that parking lot, the remainder of the paved area for the site is actually piped into a series of three 36 inch diameter pipelines that are buried <coughs> underneath the parking area. Those provide storage. That's that flooding uh, continuation of control for that. Our outlet control structure is right there in that corner. And that controls how much water comes off the site. So as I mentioned, we are doing a mix of different things in order to provide stormwater management. We're managing the peak rate of discharge to the pre-development levels. And it should be noted that our pre-development level calculates based on what's on the site right now. It doesn't take into account the fact that up until 2013, there was a large set of buildings that were on the site. As a matter of fact, the impervious area associated with the existing improvements that were associated with the Widow's Walk was actually almost comparable to the size of the existing building now. So we didn't take that into account. We scaled it back and said, right now, this is an undeveloped site, so we're starting with an undeveloped site. And we are controlling our peak rates of discharge in accordance with the ordinance criteria to the pre-development levels. So <clears throat> stormwater in a nutshell, everybody loves stormwater. So um, right now, what I'd like to do is, oh, I just wanted to, to mention another thing on that. Um, we have filed our stormwater permit by rule application with the DEP uh, that was filed last week. We do have a two-week review period for that. Uh, but we do expect that that approval will come in prior to the next meeting. So that will be a uh, uh, check off, if you will. We've also filed requests for a ability to serve letter from the Portland Water District that's under review by their engineer. And <coughs> excuse me, we've also filed application materials with the sanitary district to request a similar. We spoke to the superintendent today. Uh, we expect that that uh, ability to serve letter will be forthcoming by the end of this week and will be on board for the trustees' review uh, for that as well. So I did mention that we do have other folks here to speak. The first person that I'm going to turn it over to is Bill Bray. And Bill's going to discuss the process with traffic. <coughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Nancy. Good evening. Uh, Bill Bray with Traffic Solutions. I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time walking <coughs> through the details of the traffic evaluation that we've completed for this project. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit further as I go along, but we have expended uh, countless hours in not only trying to analyze it with the computer tools that are available to us, but we've also spent considerable time in the field watching uh, traffic uh, along Black Point Road as well as traffic through the Oak Hill intersection. The proposed uh, 8,700 plus square feet uh, medical office building can be expected to generate about 21 trips uh, during the morning peak hour. Again, this is based on national standards for a medical office building. That's a trip of about every three minutes uh, during the rush hour in the morning. Of those 21 trips, 17 of the trips will enter the site and four trips will exit. In the evening peak hour, the site will generate uh, a few more trips at 31 vehicle trips, or a trip every two minutes, with nine trips entering the site and 22 trips exiting the site. In evaluating the project, we uh, conducted uh, several traffic counts, uh, both at Oak Hill and as well as at the Atria our nursing home driveway entrance at Black Point Road. We collected data between 8 a.m. Uh, between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning uh, during the month of September uh, at Oak Hill and the uh, Atria driveway uh, to capture the impact of school traffic on Black Point Road. In the evening, uh, we collected traffic data between uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 6 p.m again at both Oak Hill and the Atria driveway inter intersection. That data was collected late during the month of June in 2017 and the traffic data, uh, the peak hour data from that uh, was adjusted by state uh, adjustment factors to approximate peak <coughs> conditions uh, during a typical summer month. In addition, uh, as I stated, we had a second technician that was stationed at the Atria uh, nursing home entrance. Their task was to um, directionally count trips entering and exiting that facility during the same hours. Uh, with the peak hour summation of the information, uh, we took those peak hour values at the Atria nursing home and expanded those by approximately 31% to account for the present occupancy of that facility. Right now the facility is running at about 70% of uh, capacity, uh, so we wanted to increase those numbers to account for full occupancy of the site. The next step in the process was to conduct a full safety audit on Black Point Road uh, from Oak Hill uh, to the Eastern Road intersection. We contacted the main Department of Transportation's Safety Bureau requesting the most recent three-year traffic uh, crash data for that section of Black Point Road. MDOT's report for the years 2014 through 2016 identified two high crash locations along that section of roadway. The first one uh, is Black Point Road between the Oak Hill intersection and Thornton Road. There was 20 accidents in the three-year time period with a critical rate factor, which is simply the comparison of this location with a statewide average for a similar location, was 1.96. Historically, as far back as I can recall, and I've done personally multiple reviews of this section of uh, Black Point Road for the town and other development projects, uh, this section uh, has been uh, a high crash location with more or less the same number of crashes occurring uh, every three in every three year study period again as far back as I can recall. Our investigations uh, of the most current data and again uh, going back historically uh, the predominant uh, accident type that occurs is ac angle accidents 
involving left-turning vehicles coming in or out of the Sitco gas station. And in this particular case, 10 of the 20 accidents were either left-turn vehicles uh, entering the site or exiting from uh, the uh, Sitco gas station. In 2016, the town uh, completed some improvements to that driveway intersection of the Sitco station. They squared the alignment of the driveway with Black Point Road, uh, hoping to encourage people that were exiting the driveway onto Black Point Road to uh, slow down and exiting and also allow them full visibility in both directions before they actually completed that turn. Additionally, they, uh, the town implemented uh, turn, uh, left turn restrictions uh, with, during the peak hours at the driveway. Understanding the true effectiveness of this improvement uh, really uh, is something that needs to wait until DOT re uh, provides their uh, next current three year uh, data of traffic crashes, which will occur sometime in uh, late May or early June of this year. Excuse me, the second uh, high crash location was at the Black Point Road, uh, Eastern Road intersection. A total of nine crashes occurred at this location, and again, the critical rate factor was 1.52. A review of each of the police reports that um, were included in the nine vehicle collisions occurring at the intersection shows that four of the nine collisions involved either a pedestrian or a bicyclist using the crosswalk uh, to reach uh, one or the other side of Black Road. I didn't do that. I'll keep going. I don't. I don't really need it for my purposes, but I think there's a. Oh, Thanks, saw. Rick. Good job. Thank you. Years of training. Still crooked. Three of the four pedestrian bicycle-related crashes occurred uh, with vehicles approaching the crosswalk on the north of uh, the south to north approach of Black Point Road. I went out in the field and, and watched traffic for a considerable amount of time actually prior to conducting this traffic impact study on another project. Uh, and at my, uh, my review at that time, and I would continue to suggest that it, perhaps the addition of another uh, flashing beacon uh, facing traffic approaching uh, from the south uh, at the intersection, because in my opinion, the current uh, flashing beacon in that direction uh, doesn't provide uh, the length of, of visibility that, in my opinion, should be provided. So I've suggested uh, previously and, and continue to suggest that an additional uh, flashing, be beacon, uh, flashing beacon be added for that direction of travel. The next step in the process was to forecast uh, both uh, pre-development and post-development traffic uh, values for both Oak Hill and the Atria driveway intersection. The first step in developing those development, post-development, pre-development and post-development traffic values was to determine what other development projects that have either recently been approved by the town or are currently in the uh, planning process and the ones that would in fact impact uh, both of these of the study intersections. We identified nine projects uh, that actually uh, either limited or have direct impact on Oak Hill. The trips gener generated by each of those projects were combined and we have added another 247 trips during the AM peak hour. Again, those are projects that are not 
existing today, but in fact have been approved, whose traffic will circulate through Oak Hill and or uh, the Atria driveway intersection. And in the evening peak hour, we've added another 276 trips uh, to the existing traffic volumes measured at the intersection. Just to put that all into perspective, our analysis was based upon the, a peak hour volume of 3,603 vehicles during the morning peak hour and a staggering 5,022 vehicles in the afternoon. That's what's currently going through the intersection plus the additional 276 vehicles. We've conducted a detailed capacity analysis of both intersections. Um, we have used the standard uh, traffic models that are accepted both in the state of Maine and nationally for conducting traffic uh, analysis or operations at any intersection. As a summary, overall, the proposed project has no measurable impact on intersection operation both at Oak Hill and has very minimal uh, impact at the Atria driveway intersection uh, with Black Point Road. In the AM peak hour, under pre-development conditions, Oak Hill intersection operates overall at level of service D conditions with approximately 43 seconds of vehicle delay. During this same time period, the Black Point Road approach operates at level of service F with 83 seconds of vehicle delay. I'm providing this information so that you can understand hopefully the, the very marginal difference in level of service and vehicle delay that the project cre creates. In the post development condition for the AM peak hour, the intersection continue, continues to operate at level of service D with 46 seconds of overall vehicle delay, an increase of three seconds. And the Black Point Road approach operates with 90 seconds of uh, average vehicle delay. Again, these are morning peak hour <coughs> conditions. In the PM peak hour, similar results occur. Under pre-development, the average delay at the intersection is 107 seconds. And in the post-development, <coughs> that increases by four seconds to 111 seconds. Vehicle delay on the Black Point Road approach is significantly lower during the evening peak hour than what's found during the morning rush hour. Under pre-development, the value is 53 seconds of average vehicle delay, and that increases to 62 seconds in the build condition. <coughs> Understanding quite well the concern of the town and quite frankly the concern of the development team on the operation of Black Point Road, especially during the morning rush hour. Um, I have had the privilege of working for the town of Scarborough on reviewing multiple projects over the years as well as uh, conducting traffic surveys in the town for private developers and the Oak Hill intersection has been a long-standing concern operation at this intersection. So quite frankly, I want to be able to stand here this evening and state uh, that we have looked at this, we've examined it, and quite frankly, what we're providing, in, in, our, in my opinion, is that we're providing a product uh, with a very uh, low generation of trips, and we're trying to clearly understand what's going on at Oak Hill and su suggest some improvements that will change the operation at Oak Hill, especially during the morning peak hour. So with that, we conducted a second set of analysis for the morning peak hour. <coughs> the traffic signal modeling equipment used to evaluate operations at an intersection uh, provides uh, a tool whereby the computer program will predict or optimize signal timing at an intersection. We took those values and we recalculated the capacity of the Oak Hill intersection and quite frankly I was uh, very surprised at the 
overall benefit that simply uh, changing the timings at the intersection uh, can provide. For example, uh, it was our, what we evaluated was that the amount of green time currently allocated uh, to the Gorham Road approach, quite frankly, is uh, a greater level of green time than is what's necessary by simply taking some of that green time and reallocating it to the Black Point Road approach makes a tremendous difference in the level of service and delay on that Black Point Road approach. We've provided the town with uh, the existing signal timings that are presently operating at Oak Hill and compared those times with uh, recommended or the optimized times uh, developed by the computer. The results, as I said, uh, quite frankly, uh, quite surprising. We're able to reduce the delay um, at the overall intersection from about 46 seconds down to 34 seconds, a significant improvement in overall operation at Oak Hill. And I, can, I just want to stop here and just clarify. I, I'm personally, the, I think most of you know me pretty well, I'm not going to stand up here and, and make a statement that I can't support. And clearly the information in the process that we've gone through, I'm very comfortable standing here this evening and expressing these opinions because I believe the information that we've concluded, in fact, does work. Um, and the level of delay on Black Point Road, we can more or less reduce or cut it in half from what it is out there today during the morning peak hour. These recommended signal times do not distract uh, from the uh, coordinated uh, travel band along Route 1. Uh, in fact, it may actually improve it. Uh, it reduces the vehicle delay uh, overall in the intersection. And most notably, it reduces vehicle delay on the Black Point Road approach. In my opinion, the average motorist traveling Black Point Road during the time period of, say, 7 to 8 o'clock or perhaps uh, as late as 7.30 to 8.30 will definitely notice a marked improvement in traffic operations on that Black Point Road approach at Oak Hill. We have suggested to the town that they implement these proposed signal timings uh, as a pilot program, test them for a period of two weeks, evaluating their effectiveness uh, during that two weeks uh, time period. And if they prove successful or if they require some minor tweaking, do that and implement them to improve traffic operations at Oak Hill. A process, a part of the process of calculating vehicle capacity is also developing a queue analysis for uh, different uh, turn lanes or even in some cases the through travel lanes uh, on a specific, at a specific intersection. We conducted that queue analysis as part of our analysis of both Oak Hill and the driveway uh, entrance uh, to the Atria nursing home. We developed that for both pre-development and post-development travel conditions for the Black Point Road approach. In the AM peak hour, and again, I realize that I'm not telling anything to anybody that doesn't already know this, that the vehicle queues on Black Point Road uh, extend uh, beyond the driveway entrance to the Atria nursing home. We have calculated that that uh, queue length should be somewhere around 750 to 800 feet, when in fact today, uh, and I'm going to get back to this topic in a few minutes, but. Uh, Based on today's observations that I have conducted on the intersection, that vehicle queue for a period of maybe 20 minutes during the morning extends well beyond that 700 feet. And I'll explain in greater detail of what I believe the reason is for that. Implementation of the traffic signal timing changes that we have recommended significantly reduce this queue length. Uh, we can cut that queue length in half pushing the queue well beyond the uh, measured distance between Oak Hill and the driveway entrance. There's a space of 610 feet there today. 
It's our belief that we can get that vehicle queued someplace between 300 and 400 feet. Again, freeing up the driveway completely from uh, queued traffic waiting at Oak Hill. Part of our analysis also uh, evaluated capacity of the site driveway and Black Point Road. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, the wait time for getting out of Black Point Road under both the pre-development and post-development condition is someplace between 6 and 15 seconds. Under post-development conditions, that increases slightly uh, to as much as 20 seconds in the a.m. peak hour and about 15 seconds in the evening peak hour. If the uh, recommended signal timing changes were implemented at Oak Hill again for the morning peak hour, the vehicle delay and the length of those queues are uh, again uh, reduced significantly. We also evaluated the left turn pocket uh, for turning into the Atria driveway from Black Point Road. That is a hundred foot uh, storage capacity there or four vehicles. All of our measurements show that that never exceeds uh, two vehicles or approximately 50 feet. Uh, leaving a balance of uh, two additional uh, spaces for queued up vehicles. As we've gone through this process, we've continued to be perplexed uh, of why the long delays occur every morning on Black Point Road. <coughs> we have analyzed the using the computer models We've gone back and double-checked them to make sure that we didn't make an error. And still, the answer keeps coming up that the queue length should be someplace between 700 and perhaps as much as 750 to 800 feet uh, from Black Point Road, based on traffic volumes that are about 250 vehicles greater than what you see out there today. So to perhaps get a better understanding of what actually is going on because in my opinion and it has been for a considerable time that perhaps there's something mechanically or programmably wrong with the operation of the Oak Hill uh, signalized intersection. Um, on three different occasions I sat out on Black Point Road in my vehicle uh, off of the road and watched traffic uh, during the peak hours uh, on Black Point Road approaching the Oak Hill intersection. I'll give you the dates that I was out there, perhaps. Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you think you'll be done fairly soon? Because we... I, 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 I should be another... Because we, we're going to have, we need to leave time for public comment and board deliberation, and we're already coming up on an hour into the meeting. Okay, so I, me, I appreciate I'll, that you have a lot to share, but I just want to make sure I'll we... I'll squeeze it. I'll squeeze I it. I just want to finish this one comment. Okay. I think Thank it's you. very, very important. Thanks. Um, the field studies that we conducted uh, were on November 29th between 3.45 and 5.35 p.m., again on November 30th between 7 and 8.31 a.m., and again on the final date, December 5th, where we actually took stopwatch recordings uh, of the traffic cycle length and the <coughs> green time length uh, measured on Black Point Road. Again, I'll skip through this because uh, the last thing that I want to just state is that we identified a defect or some sort of a out of sync problem with the traffic controller at Oak Hill. It is clearly there, there is no question about it. Uh, there is approximately 30 seconds of green time allocated to the Black Point Road approach during the morning peak hour. Twice during that hourly time period, for a reason that I wasn't able to uh, determine, that 30 plus seconds of green time dropped down to eight seconds. Well, when you have about a quarter of the average time that's typically provided, then clearly something's gonna happen. And what happens within that very short period of time, traffic backs up to two or three times greater than what it normally is on that approach. I provided this information uh, to Mr. Chase in a, in a letter that details the survey that we conducted out there. And it's my understanding that the town has uh, reviewed uh, the operation of the intersection from the controller cabinet. And based on what I was 
told, I think I'm quoting it correctly, that there are opportunities that they found uh, for improving the operation of that intersection. Uh, so I'll, uh, in the, um, to try to be considered of the time constraints, I'll, I'll leave my uh, comments at that point. Thank you. Thank you. I have a feeling you might get a chance to answer questions later. Thank you. Chairman, we do have two other folks that will speak briefly on that. Okay. The first is Keith Smith, who will talk about landscaping, and then Deirdre Pio with regard to the building sure. itself. So. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Keith Smith, uh, landscape architect, Terrence Swan and Associates. Um, so I'll, I'll give a brief overview of the landscape, um, and then we can get into further discussion later on. So I'm going to start off along Black Point Road in the front of the building. Uh, there exists one, two three, four, five existing trees. The intention is to keep those trees <coughs> in sight. Um, there's minimal grading out there. Um, this one right there in particular um, may encounter a little bit of uh, adverse grading and we'll try to keep, but we, our intention is to keep those trees out of the site. Um, in addition to that, we're adding two additional street trees along the way. We'll have some uh, planting along the building and in the parking area, there's Three groups, uh, two groups of shrubs. Uh, those are um, viburnums, which are flowering um, shrubs that get fairly sizable to provide some screening. And then behind that, there's three clumps of, clumps of uh, ornamental grasses. And what they're going to do is provide screening as well um, up the parking. And at the same time, they're closer to the parking because they're perennials. They'll um, provide snow storage in the wintertime because you can plow snow up on top of them. The atria, the existing woods are going to remain. So along the edge of the parking, um, I provided uh, some native uh, animal anchor trees, as well as some clumps of uh, red fruit dogwood and some bayberry. So I'm trying to use native plants as much as possible um, and naturalize that edge with the existing woods. As you come into the site, I'm providing where the green line, you know, around. Um, is where the limits of grading are essentially. So um, that would be new understory uh, seating. Um, and then I have some trees coming in there. Along the outsides, I'm using some native red oaks um, in areas where there, where there are walkways. I like to use oak because of the, the, the acorns. I don't want to use them where there's walkways, so I try to fit them in where it's feasible. Um, and that's an elm, Princeton elm. As we get into the site, um, we have, as Nancy mentioned earlier, the, the under drain next to the building. So there's like a two and a half foot section of stone. And then outside of that, um, along the front, I've provided a shrub base. Um, there's going to be, and this is the north side of the building, so these are all shade um, loving plants. So there's clethra, there's some rhododendron, um, and then there's some hosta along there. So the vegetation is not going to be real bloomy, um, but it's going to be vegetated. There are some clumps of astilde which um, can handle some of the shade and also provides some spring flowering. Um, and the corner treatments, uh, those are perennials and some ornamental grasses. Um, and then these two sides that we're gonna get into, this is where the buffering occurs. This is a residential section. Um, so according to the ordinance, we need to provide some buffering. So what I've done, what I did while I looked at this was consider you know, the critical points of buffering. There's a residential section here. There's a residential section there. You know, and their views would be up this hill and across. Um, so what I did was try to beef that up in those areas. Uh, as far as trying to think out what the best solution would be, uh, what I came up with was a tiered system, trying to use both evergreen and deciduous trees. Um, being that the evergreen, it's, it would be impossible because that's a fairly steep slope down on both sides. It would be impossible to plant a tree large enough to provide screening right up front. So my intention was to provide you know, an evergreen layer 
and then a deciduous layer. The evergreen layer is going to eventually grow to a point where it's going to provide that buffering. Um, but in the meantime, the deciduous is going to be almost immediate, and it's going to have at least seasonal buffering um, from views onto the site. Um, and because you're lower, I think for the most part, it's within a five-year period, it'll pretty much screen the majority of the buildings. Uh, same thing on this side. Uh, along here, there's some white pine um, that's continuous with the existing white pine and some spruce that are going to remain at that upper part of the site. So this clump right here is existing vegetation that's intended to remain. Um, we will lose a couple spruce that are in this area, um, but I've brought the planting buffer all the way up to that edge. Uh, so, so as you can see, we have the staggered series of, of white pine, and then I have some uh, taller, I think those are maples right there behind that are going to provide that upper level of deciduous. Um, in this area, because um, these are snow storage areas, both here and here, what I wanted to do um, was get the plants a little further away to provide enough storage. So in doing so uh, along here, I had to put the deciduous plants on the outside of it. Um, it's not as ideal. Um, I, I prefer them on the back side, but in this scenario, I used um, a fir right here that can handle the shade a little better, knowing that these uh, deciduous trees are going to provide a little more um, shade on those trees. Uh, along the back, between the white property line and the green disturbed line, um, you'll see a strip of, of existing vegetation. Um, there's a fairly substantial clump of trees right here, which falls just at the edge of where the disturbance would be. Um, and our intention is to retain that vegetation along there so that we do retain some natural buffer, buffer along that uh, easterly side. And then up, up into the front <coughs> line, uh, there's a walkway that comes back to the building. Uh, we have perennials along the edge of the build, building on both sides here, which is nice. Snow can be cleared off and it's not going to be disturbing the plants. Um, I provided a few ornamental trees on the inside. Um, here's a uh, unit, uh, condensing unit, um, for which I've placed some uh, lilac and some additional uh, shrub planting. And that's essentially the landscape plan. I, on the uh, lighting, I have five pictures. There's one there, there's one there, one there, one there, and one there. Um, and I had cut sheets uh, and a photometric along with that. Um, it's 18 feet high, it's a full cutoff fixture. Um, and it should do the job uh, with the next round. Now that the architecture is done, we're going to be coordinating that. Um, so there'll be one rend uh, further rendition that will show the fixtures on the buildings. Um, so outside of that, I think that addresses a lot of the concerns. One other question in the, in the comments. Um, there's a, a uh, culvert that goes under here. And I have adjusted that tree so that it's not in interference with the culvert. And there is a swale that runs around this edge of the site at the bottom, and at the <coughs> three location so that they no longer run the soils there. So, thank you. Thanks. And next up, we have Deirdre, who is going to talk about the architecture. Deirdre Pio with Gowan Turgeon Architects. I realize you didn't have much time to review any of the building drawing, the perspectives and elevations themselves, but we did want to speak to the design for <coughs> future reviews that we will have. Working with the existing footprint that was developed and working with Dr. Kayer on his program, we came up with a design that we felt was in scale with the residential neighborhood. And we looked at the approach in terms of the view here is coming up from Black Point Road. And this view here would be the view facing the parking lot. So would be the main entrance for 
the doctor's office and the main entrance for the future tenants in the back. We wanted to create an aesthetic that met the doctor's vision along with what we thought would be appropriate for the neighborhood, being a friendly neighbor ourselves, and wanting to see low sloping roof lines. We try not to, on this elevation here, create a lot of gable ends to soften the what you would see for building massing. We're also proposing and working as we develop the exterior elevation and materials further, we are introducing multiple levels of material. The stone on the bottom facade of the building, shingle style along with clapboard, and in addition to the landscaping, we'll also look at how we treat the facade as you go around the building, knowing that there's slope and what you'll actually be seeing from Black Point Road, in addition to the neighborhood as well. We want to be respective of what the neighbors are seeing and viewing for the building aesthetic. We're still working through specific locations for windows, but the size and scale that you see here is, for the most part, what we were going to approach uh, for the final design. So not to take up too much time, I know it, it was um, low on the list to review, but I did want everybody to have an opportunity sure. to see what it looked like. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, well, that, that concludes our presentation. We're here to answer any questions that you may have, and I understand you'll be opening up public Great. comment now. Thank you. Yes, and before we uh, do open it up to public comment, just a reminder, um, if you want to say something, please come on up, introduce yourself, give your address. Please keep your comments to five minutes or less. Uh, please try not to be too repetitive. Um, and please address any questions or comments to the board and not the applicant. And with that, I will open up the floor. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Jones at Jones & Warren, and I'm here representing the Oak Hill Condo Association. And I just want to make sure that I've submitted a letter, and I want to make sure it made yes. it in a loose packet. We do. All right, so I won't belabor my points. Right. Thank you. Um, but my point on the stormwater is this is a, grass, a grassy area that's just depressed, and all those calculations might work in July and August, but they're not going to work in January and February when the ground's frozen and there's snow. Uh, where they're doing their snow storage is right exactly where, next to where the one of their one of their grassy underground um, stormwater filters exists. So um, that stormwater, once it freezes up, or the ground freezes, all that water is going to run down onto my client's property. There's going that's not going to that's not going to be at the same efficiency in July, January, and February as if they're saying it's going to happen in July and August. The um, the buffering is inadequate. They're, 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 they want to put in five to six foot evergreens. Well, the topography of that, um, it slopes dramatically down from the back of the building. So with 18 foot pole, um, poles for the lighting, which is shining directly towards my client's property instead of towards the building, that, that's going to be shining directly onto the condos and our property uh, because of the slope. So. The buffering there at five or six feet of evergreens um, isn't going to come close. The top of those trees are going to be basically at the at the first floor of that building, so it's not. It's, we're going to be getting the noise and the light pollution. So, um, the traffic. I don't know if this if the traffic safety issue can be solved with lights um, and tweaking the light at Oak Hill. I mean, uh, we've all in this room. I've seen it just keep getting worse and worse on Black Point Road, and then I don't know what that what the breaking point is going to be, but um, I think this board has to consider that as to whether this is a good project, but just in the wrong location. And again, they they've made no commitments about the tenants. So if you put they, they're asking for a lot more parking spots, which is more impervious surface, which is more runoff towards my client's property, 
So the more parking spots, the more cars, the more traffic. And so we think that, that there should be a reduction of those um, because, again, they only state that their goal is to have medical tenants. It doesn't say that that's a restriction. And so if you have a high volume tenant that comes in as one of those other two units, it could be a real issue. And I think we really have to have some recommendations on that as well. So I have, there's two other board members that want to speak tonight um, because they are actual condo owners behind and about the property. But I just want to put out basically what the, what the board's feelings was. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Jan DeMauro and I live at 22 uh, Black Point Road and I'm president of Oak Hill Condo Association. And I would just like to mention uh, again my concern about the traffic. Uh, to leave our driveway and take a left turn is virtually impossible. I work early in the morning <clears throat> and come home uh, around the 5 o'clock rush hour turning into Black Point, into the Oak Hill Condo Association, taking a, a left into there is dicey as well. Um, the study that they were talking about, they mentioned September and June, as we all know what the traffic is like in July and August on Black Point Road. Um, it's, it's really difficult, it makes it very difficult to get out and into our, our uh, association. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is on Route 1, um, I sat in that traffic waiting to turn onto Black Point Road and what I've seen is a lot of cars that are backed up at Hannaford that are coming up the, the turn lane that isn't a turn lane and it's just an accident waiting to happen. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Pam Joy and I live at 22 um, Black Point Road as well. I'm one of the unit owners. And I know that we've talked a lot about the water drainage and um, the landscaping. And I know that um, you know a lot of the data it makes perfect sense. But from um, owners who live there, hear the stories, hear what's happening. Um, since the development of Atria, we've had to spend another $3,500 putting in drainage at the foot of the hill in front of our condos. Um, that's new water that's coming down, increasing water drainage that we didn't have to do before. So that's never happened. We can see the water increasing and dropping down into that. Um, I'll, I'll use the dry diagram here. Um, <laughs> give me a shot at it. But I just, as, as mo I know you know this. Where all, we, all I'll ask you is if you can just swing that mic around so that. Yeah. Um, oh. Okay. Like they can hear it, our big TV right audience can hear you. Yeah. Well, I just yeah, I just want to point out that this is uh, this is the lower parking lot. So it goes down, and here's the lower parking lot. It goes all the way over here, and we are finding a, a dramatic increase in water drainage coming down from the road, down into that area, coming in coming across the end of uh, the back part of that property, coming down into the. Uh, into the, the uh, uh, fenced-in area we have back there. I'm not sure, you know, I can't say that's from Atria. I can't say definitely if that's from winding the road, but something's happened. Um, and we are seeing a lot more water runoff. We'd like to make sure we're protected so the next time, if any of this happens again, that someone else would have to pay for this, um, this extra drainage we're having to install around our condos. The condos got completely flooded out. The basements got completed, completely flooded. So not only did we pay for the drainage, but there had to be insurance and, you know, repairs happen with that particular issue. So that is our concern. And as Jeff noted, I don't know what the winter holds, but where all that runoff happens uh, right there, that, that's our road. So that's going to come right on our road that we have to keep plowed in the winter time or, in, in, or keep free of uh, excess water in the summertime. It's, um, it's going to be a, continue to be a challenge and extra cost to our operations. Uh, the other thing, the landscaping, as Jeff noted, we do need higher and greater uh, privacy trees and, and, and just to be able to hold more of that groundwater. 
I mean, we're putting in, I don't know how many square feet of parking lot tar, and that's a steep hill, and that's, gonna, that's just going to make it even worse. And I guess when we saw this development going on, or it was up for sale, and knowing some of the town <laughs> rules, um, I guess we were surprised with the additional parking spots. Uh, it assumed that there would be uh, parking that may be consistent with the upper side here, but to have that large of uh, hot top behind the building, going right down to the foot of the hill, going, um, you know, and, and not being captured and put into that pond that was created for Atria. I don't know how that would happen, but um, it's just going to just flow right through. And we do have condos behind us, and already the wetlands in behind on that side, you can, I've watched the last couple of years, I go walking back there, is getting increasing. So I just would like someone to take a look at that because it's going to cost uh, if this continues to increase uh, with some of these developments. And that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, twice, okay. Well, thank you for those comments. Um, as always, we'll do our best as a board to make sure those are addressed through some combination of our own discussion and Q&A with the applicant, as well as any you know, future action and deliberation with staff going forward. As I think it was clear from the top, there's going to be no formal action taken tonight. There are a few loose ends out there that the applicant detailed. Um, so this is really for us to, to see and hear all this information and for us to deliberate as a board and then we'll see where things stand so with that um, Nick would you like to get started sure that's a rhetorical question well, <laughs> I'm going to suggest that maybe we let our store water specialist have first crack at this uh, but I'll uh, just on the on the surface I do have a question um, in general the change in the condominium water flow that's being observed on the ground by the owners, is that a seasonal? Is it regular? Is it? Uh, it's well, you know, sorry, you can come sorry. back up to the podium quickly. Sorry. <coughs> Yeah, it's it's it's. I don't think it's necessarily seasonal. It's when we're getting some of these heavy rainstorms that are going on, that they're just uh, much more significant uh, water running down that hill. Um, so it's happening year round, and um, and it's just something and settling down at the foot of the hill with those parking lots. Obviously, in the winter time, that's freezing up and becoming more challenging for us. But it's uh, it's been increasing. Um, you know, it's in the last couple of years. It's gotten, it's, gets, uh, it's gotten much worse. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I just kind of want to get a sense of uh, timing. Yeah, I wish it was a certain time of year, uh, but no, it's it's. And again, it's it's especially when those big storms happen. Um, it's <laughs> the one we had a little while ago, just a few weeks ago. Again, it's uh, you can see the puddles, and you can see the, the you know the the drainage coming right down, and it's it's. Uh, Actually, it's eroding um, erosion in our driveway now. We've had to fix the driveway because the water's coming right underneath the tar and, and taking taking that away as well. So we've had to put down um, some extra tar on the driveway to fix that to keep it to keep it addressed. And I see when it comes down the hill, it's to, it, it will even now start to take a bank to the right, and we have another hill. You know, so if you've been in there, but it's uh, it's it's quite a little stream that's happening more and more now. Again, and so. Um, I don't know what the factor is, but it's uh, it's new. Thank you. Okay. Miss St. Clair, if I may, have you had an opportunity to go down and try to uh, look at some of the situation back there and just through observations or field studies? Can you tell me what you've been finding and what you may think may lead to a condition like that? We received the letter this afternoon. Okay. Um, and so we can certainly take a look at things. I did look at the original design plans uh, for the atria and their detention area. It looks to me uh, that the outlet is not directed in that location. Um, so I'm not sure at this point, I don't have a, a definitive answer for you as to what uh, that issue might be, but that's not part of our 
purview as well. So we'll certainly do what we can to help, and we certainly um, will do what we need to do to meet the standards for our site. Um, but I can't at this point answer any questions as to what might be the root of that issue. And you're confident in your studies that you've had for your site that uh, stormwater overflow or erosion, you're, you're mitigating that with the systems that you explained earlier so this evening? We do. We have done the analysis for the pre and the post development for our site in particular. We've looked at that uh, scenario and, uh, Jay, do you have the colored one of our site plan? I do not. The thumb drive doesn't seem to. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, we, if you can go back up one in that PDF. The other oh, way. It's, uh, the other way. There we go. So uh, as I mentioned in the presentation uh, earlier, in this back parking lot, you see those three pipelines? There's three 36-inch diameter buried pipes underneath the parking lot. And that is designed to uh, collect and hold back the runoff from the parking areas uh, as part of our stormwater management plan. So right, right where oh, Jay moved it, but right where his cursor is, there's an outlet control structure um, that controls for the different storm events that controls the, the rate of release and it comes out here. This area that's um, been alluded to is this is the grass under drain soil filter. It's not the grass under drain soil filter. It's actually the outlet, and it's a stone berm level lip spreader. So it is designed to disperse runoff in a sheet flow pattern off the site. Um, the grass under drain soil filter is in this location here. That provides treatment for this portion of the parking lot and flood flow control for that portion as well. So we are looking at the entire impervious area, the entire developed area of the site as part of our stormwater analysis. So we've got a combination of ways to handle that additional flow and control it to the pre-development levels on our site. Thank you. And then, uh, as far as, uh, you know, I appreciate not having another curb cut on Blackboard Road. I think that's it's a great move on your part to you know, acquire the easement, um, have access to the the property, and that by those means. So I, you know, I like what you're, you're trying to do there. As far as the traffic goes, what and um, I don't want to get too deep into this. But what what is the likelihood of actually changing the optimization of that signal? And, and not that I really personally feel that you need to be uh, altering the entire intersection to accommodate. The one property. I think that's that's probably a, above and beyond. But if you found something during your exploration, what is the likelihood that a change could be made? Is it relatively easy? Is it no? We're <laughs> chasing the state for a few years. What what is the process? Like? If I think Angela might be in a good position to answer that question as part of a, an ongoing initiative the town has. So yeah. Um, so we actually had. Um, another traffic engineer that has been out and um, going through the cabinet and the phasing and the timing um, is providing recommendations. Um, this is also obviously the Route 1 corridor very sensitive with the coordination and timing and so we are actually looking into as the town um, a master plan for the Route 1 corridor as well, the traffic signal. So changing one signal on that corridor has a domino effect. So we don't do it lightly. Um, it's something that we really need to investigate because the last thing we want to do is cause issues up and down north and south of Oak Hill um, that just bottlenecks other places. So um, we have heard um, from Mr. Bray and he's actually been at our transportation committee meetings um, and has been part of a lot of the work that we've done through that committee with the Oak Hill intersection. And so, um, we are uh, waiting for a memo spelling out those recommendations to be able to implement some of this maybe low-hanging fruit. I think um, this is a bigger thing than just changing a few green times mm -hmm. from lakes, so, though. Um, it's, it's more of a, a master plan for the entire River One corridor. You know, I was also just going to offer that I think this is a good opportunity to sort of talk about the 
ordinance requirements in terms of what the expectations are on an applicant as opposed to the community. Um, where the town has identified that we have a number of failing inter intersections, which over the course of our growth over the last 20, 30, 40 years, have led these intersections to be at the levels that were indicated before, um, that rather than having the last person in have to fix a problem that is, you know, it, it's just it's too big for one person, we have traffic impact fees. And so really the, the, what this applicant's responsibility is to Oak Hill proper is to pay those impact fees for every new trip generated. But I think you know, the, then the real question to the board is really the uh, safety and, and um, functionality at the driveway intersection itself um, and be sure that that doesn't increase the, uh, or exacerbate the issues. Um, so I know, yeah. <laughs> If I could just add one thing to that, the specific comment with regard to the driveway uh, entrance itself. As you've heard throughout the discussions, we are sharing our access with the existing entrance at Atria. There is an easement that benefits this property that allows us to have that access uh, at that point. And one <coughs> of the results of the discussions throughout the staff review is to actually add a sign that we put on our site uh, indicating not to block that driveway so that if we are dealing with queues that 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 is something that is an extra reminder uh, to uh, people in the Oak Hill area not to block the driveway but I did want to also point out that um, just as the town is looking at this as sort of a global issue and a global solution we do feel confident that as a result of our analysis particularly Bill's observations of sort of the idiosyncrasies that are happening at that intersection that don't seem to meet any sort of program issues, um, that I think there are opportunities for a solution. And it, it will come in, in time, hopefully a short time, with a memorandum. But I think there's sort of two levels here. One is, can we optimize it? And then the two more, I think, achievable is, can we fix the problem if there's a problem with the uh, hardware and software, that type of thing. So those are the types of things that I think we're moving forward with. And we're confident based on our evaluation that there are opportunities uh, that will help things in that area. And that's regardless of whether we move forward or not, that's the solution for the community as well. Uh, my last comment would be thanks for the sneak peek at the architecture. It looks great just from a superficial view here. And uh, interested to hear how the rest of this discussion goes tonight. So thank you. Thanks. Roger? Um, <clears throat> I would echo um, Nick's um, comments regarding the building. I think it looks really nice. Um, <clears throat> obviously, stormwater and the, um, the traffic are the issues. Um, and I do have a question for the condo people, so maybe you, one of you could walk up there. Um, but in the meantime, um, Nancy, uh, on that, um, do not block the driveway. That's going to be to alleviate vehicles, you know, leaving Oak Hill, going down Black Point, and turning left. Is that is that the purpose behind that? No, it's placed on our site. Yes. Facing southerly, so it's northbound traffic on Black Point Road, allowing people to turn in. Right. Pe creating a gap. Yeah, people who are heading towards the intersection. Correct. To leave that entrance clear, so people coming you know, off of uh, the intersection heading down there yes. can get in. Yes. Um, now, there's two lanes of traffic right there, I believe. So you feel pretty confident that's going to work? We do. Do you want to comment on that at all, Just, it's one lane headed up the hill. It turns into two lanes shortly thereafter in the intersection. Oh, it's not two lanes right there? Correct. No, it's just one in each direction. Plus the oh, left okay. turn lane into uh, the atria entrance. So just a total of two through lanes and then one uh, turn lane into the atria. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, again, my observations in the field uh, when I was there for the better part of four hours, uh, quite frankly, in all cases, people would automatically stop short of the driveway and allow someone to come out or get in. Uh, appropriately. I, I never saw any occurrences when people were sitting there for long periods of time. Uh, they, their people were actually gracious enough to stop and let them out. 
So again, I hope the sign just becomes a reminder that uh, people would, you know, try to do that uh, when necessary. Okay. Okay, Miss Joy. <laughs> uh, I'm just kind of curious. Um, before Atria was built, did you have any? You had no stormwater, no drainage problems, or anything like that. Um, I'm I'm not going to say that. I've not been there years and years and years, and then someone else maybe can speak to that. But uh, since I've been there, there weren't any um, drainage issues on that side. There's. Uh, on another side of the complex, further down, closer to the Eastern Road, uh, there may have been something in the past, but not not where we're not <coughs> not um, right there next to the driveways. That's that's all new occurrence. So. Okay, because as I recall, that whole property there kind of drops yeah. down dramatically down towards Eastern Trail, Eastern Road. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering. Um, when the widow's walk was there, mm -hmm. um, I'm just <coughs> wondering whether this actually this project could actually alleviate some of the problems that they might be having because this looks like it's pretty extensive stormwater management. <coughs> so, um, just kind of curious about. I don't know. I, I guess um, one thing I would point out. I think I said in my opening comments was that um, whenever you increase impervious area on a site, mm -hmm. you can control the flow coming off it and how quickly it comes off. That's where we talk about peak flows, and and you can have a large storm but like make it bleed out slowly. But the actual volume of water will always increase with the increase in impervious area on a site. So any additional development <coughs> means more volume of water. Okay, if uh, I can ask Angela another question. Sure. Um, is the flow of water, the stone water, is it now like where Atria is? Is it going down towards, say, Starbucks in that area, or is it going down towards Eastern, Eastern Road? Do you know? I, I have not looked at their, okay. um, like Nancy was saying, their pond has, does have an outfall, and there is a large wetland complex behind that pond. So. I'd have to look at it to say for okay. sure. Okay. Is that, is that the pond right there, that gray, gray, gray area? Okay. It has a pond. <laughs> and we do get annual inspections and maintenance logs from the atrium that their pond is being maintained and it's um, functioning mm -hmm. properly. Yeah. Well, that, and, and just to interject, if you don't mind, that was going to be. Uh, just a really specific question that I had for, for Angela was whether there was any reason to think that the Atria stormwater system was not functioning the way it was designed and approved. Because if we don't have any reason, any factual basis for that, then you can have a lot of anecdotal discussion. And of course, we appreciate all the feedback, but I think we have to be really careful about trying to ground things as much as possible in verifiable data. So there may be some additional legwork, field work to do. But um, that was just a general thought that I had. Okay. <clears throat> just the last, <clears throat> the last thing now, maybe uh, to Jay. Um, if, during, if we did, were to approve this, could there be a condition as to the type of tenants? Um, yes. So I think that was, um, yes. The, the traffic, I think, uh, trip generation will really sort of be the driver of what users can be at the site. So that is something the board could look at. Okay. Yeah. I'm awesome. Thanks, Roger. Susan? Thank you. Well, I think it's happened. I think we've reached critical mass. We all knew it was going to happen. Thank God we have a uh, impact fee because it's going to take an enormous amount of money, a lot of time, a lot of patience, and a lot of creativity to do something about the intersection of Black Point Road and Route 1. I don't pretend that this one additional um, building development you know, is going to make that much of a difference right now. But I don't know. I live on Black Point Road. And the, the um, times that Mr. Bray talked about that they studied and what the trips were, I think they're probably absolutely accurate. But I experience things such as 
coming down Black Point Road from Route 1 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the cars are backed up down to the end of um, where it turns to go across the bridge. Why? You know why? Because people are using Black Point Road as a cut through from South Portland and Cape Elizabeth. And when they come up Black Point Road, they're coming to turn left to go south rather than doing all the other things that are available. Now, I know. What do I know? Well, I live there and I watch it day after day after day. So how does that relate to this particular development? Well, in subtle ways, I think that if we do nothing but take Mr. Bray's observations about the fact that the light itself may not be working adequately and clean that up, that's a step in the right direction. But I also understand that what Angela is saying is really big because the, the way to solve this problem is not just at Black Point Road because this is Route 1. And you do anything at Route 1 and Black Point Road, you've got to figure out what you're going to do all the way up and down Black Point Road. And now that, again, this is a huge problem. I'm not blaming the applicant. It's just that we all knew something was going to come along that was going to make this happen. <clears throat> so I see this traffic as being number one on the hit parade <clears throat> as to how to take care of it. And um, because I live so close to this, I'm going to be very, 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 very picky. And I bet I'm not going to be the only one. The next thing about um, stormwater, I don't pretend to understand stormwater because we have experts about stormwater here on the board and on staff, and I'm sure that they can figure this out. The only thing I really do want to go on record as approving is that, uh, first of all, um, I want to ur urge staff to work with the applicant to write into their um, Conditions. Thank you. A condition that it be medical offices. Okay, that's, to me that's a given. The other thing is <coughs> um, to cover the expenses that might incur to the people who live below, because as Angela says, they're doing the the, the applicant is doing the best they can and with some very sophisticated ways of holding the water back and releasing it under controlled circumstances. That would not have happened a few years ago because the science wouldn't have allowed it, but here we are. And I think that's very exciting. But it's going to come out. It is going to filter out. And there has to be some kind of a situation in this um, uh, permission for them to have their permits that says that there has to be a way of, of observing, noting, studying, I don't know what the word is, what happens after a major storm, maybe it's how many how much water there is or whatever to investigate what's going on at the bottom of this. Okay, I just think that they have a right to ask to have the applicant <clears throat> bear some responsibility. And I, have, at this point, I don't know how that would look, but that's just my feedback. Um, what else? Oh, I'm known as a landscape lady. So, landscape. White pines. I just spent $2,000 cutting down white pines. Now, why would I do that? Because they're so big. Oh, because every, <laughs> my neighbor is looking at me because he gives me garbage every time he sees me about the fact that I cut down white pines. But it's because they die from the bottom up. They, you know, um, um, hemlock doesn't do that. Okay, but white pine dies from the bottom up. So if you're down below where these people live and you're looking up the hill, very soon, I mean, you know, I'm old enough to know it doesn't, but soon is, you're going to be looking right through blank um, trunks of white pine. So wherever those white pines are being put in for buffer, take another look, plant something else in addition to, I suggested it be um, hemlock underneath those white pines, so that as the white pine drops, there's going to be something underneath it that will provide some buffering. Um, I don't know there were other things. I think the building is fine. There's nothing brilliant about it. There's nothing unique about it. It looks like everything else has gone up in Scarborough in the last 10 years. But it meets the, um, it meets the ordinance. So I don't have much to say about that. And I have to laugh. I mean, this is not a funny situation, but I have to laugh. Really, putting up a do not block the driveway sign is going to have an impact? You've got to be kidding me. How many times have I seen people almost get creamed coming out of the um, 
gas station. I almost got cream trying to come out of the gas station. I don't do it anymore. No more going in out of that gas station. Thank you very much. I don't know how long it's going to be for somebody coming out of the pizza place, Amato's, to have a meal. This is a terrible intersection. It's going to be the worst, in, it's the worst one in Scarborough. There's nothing about it that's good. It's horrible. But you're going to put up a little sign that says, do not block the driveway, and that's going to do it. I do admit that people can be very nice. I, I am. I stop to let people into the condos. I stop to let people into the gas station. But when you're dealing with, um, what was that figure? I can't remember the figure, but it was a thousand or something. People, really? It's not going to work. It'll look cute, and it'll get all battered up by the, by the um, snow plows, and you know, it will do absolutely nothing. So I'm not impressed. Other than that, I'll move along. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin? Yeah. <clears throat> I was um, very glad to hear that um, Angela had you explore the 100 year storm because that was my first note. What about 50 and 100 year storm events? So thanks for doing that. Um, I, I really caution you though on, on saying that a 50 year storm event or a 100 year storm event is only going to have a 1% chance. It's just not the way it is these days. Um, so we've got some real complexities going on here and some things that we're trying to figure out. And um, some of them uh, are where all the discharge points are from this site. And I like where Roger was going as far as maybe this will help, maybe this will be better than pre-development. But I think what, in addition to the additional impervious cover that Angela's talking about is we're having, we have, instead of, the storm water being uh, discharged evenly throughout the site, we're now collecting it and, and directing it to certain outlet control structures. And how many outlet control structures do we have at this point, Nancy? There are two within the site. Okay, and they're one from the underground storage? One is to control the underground storage in the parking area, that's correct. That's, my pen ran out of ink, so I apologize for that, but. That outlet control structure is right up in there. Okay. And where's the where does the under drain soil filter? There's an outlet control structure right there for the grass under drain soil filter. So the under drain comes in the downstream end of that outlet control right. structure, the six inch pipe. Yep. Then there's an inlet to that structure right here. There's an orifice, I believe it's two inch diameter. Uh, that controls the flow, the water surface elevation in this area. Okay. And then that pipe comes out there, that one comes there. The two meet in that uh, swale area okay. with the stone berm level lip spreaders right there. So the point I guess that I'm making is that, that these two areas are going to have a tremendous amount of volume coming out of them. And did Angela talk to you about the orifice being that small? Two inches and the problems with it getting clogged and things like that? Both of the outlet control structures have a panel on them that okay. is a screen that is intended to protect okay. um, for clogging. Okay, and the drip line trench system, is that getting piped also to the same underground the storage roof, area? The roof drip line BMP around the perimeter of the building, right there, the footing drain ties in again to the downstream end of that outlet control structure. Okay, and um, roof drip line trench, under drain soil filter. And the level lip spreader, how far of a setback do we have from the property line where that is um, discharging? Um, I haven't measured it. Um, I would believe it's probably on the order of roughly uh, 10 feet to the downstream okay. edge of it. Okay. And um, I guess my point in, in going through this with you, um, Nancy, is that it's a fairly complex system. And I'm going to ask that the HydroCAD model be peer reviewed by either Angela or Woodard and Curran because I'm seeing on my map, I'm sorry, sheet. On sheet 12, sheet 12, that there's only one study point, SP1. Correct. Okay. And and yet, I, I think uh, we're talking about there's an easement. There's sort of like an off-site easement that has a culver and some, some other things in the northern part of the site where, remind me, is there a catch basin up there too that's feeding into this? That basin? Yep. If you look, it's a... Field inlet with a beehive grate is yep. right there. Right. It provides crossover. So, in our pre development conditions, 
we looked at the site and what was at the downstream end of the site mm -hmm. as our study point. Mm -hmm. In the post-development condition, our post-development improvements included this portion of the driveway as part of our program. So this field inlet and cross culvert is to collect the flows that were coming down off the atria site mm -hmm. and coming down in this area. So this off-site area is collected in that field inlet, directed over to here, and that's an inlet to the atria's pond. So their off-site flow, we're not adding any new flow to it. It's just simply collecting what was on their off-site. We would be impounding it if we didn't put something underneath that driveway. So we put a field inlet and a, and a structure across to come into that inlet to that pond. And where does the northern parking lot drain to? The northern parking lot is collected in a basin right there, so it drains down here. Yep. You can see the channel there. You can mm -hmm. see it coming down to that point there. That's part of that <coughs> piping system that's yep. controlled by that outlet control structure and stored in those three 36-inch diameter pipes that are each 130 feet long. Yeah, and I just, I, I, I guess, but I, I heard you say that only 50% of the impervious cover is uh, treated. Treated. Correct. Treated. Treated. So is it still all stored? Is 100% of the impervious cover stored? 100% of the impervious cover is attenuated as part of the plan. Yes. And let's see. Had another comment about the buffer, the buffers, the tree buffers. Um, I I was reading the um, <clears throat> I was reading the comments before we got this letter today. So so I was sort of on the same page with um, my colleague Miss Oglis about the vegetation and making sure that there is enough. And and um, the public brought up a good point about the 18 foot poles and the five to six foot trees. So. Is that sort of existing buffer along the southerly and easterly property lines, I'm, I'm sorry, the existing vegetation, is that really enough to um, meet the ordinance requirements for landscape requirements? Down, down on this end, mm -hmm. um, on the east end? Yep. Like I said, right, right in that section, there's a large clump that's deciduous trees. It's not evergreen trees, so, so it does filter. Um, and how will that be marked off so that it's not cut during construction? We can probably just yeah. Let's make sure that that's not cut down. And and, and then in this section, um, it's all evergreen. And 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 to address Susan's, I'm not a white pine fan either. Um, the existing trees that are out there, there's a lot of white pine existing. Um, I don't use them a lot. In this particular zone, just to kind of continue this line is why I used them to match into the existing buffer. Um, and, on, and on the lower part down here, you know, it's kind of away from everything and kind of naturalized with mm -hmm. the rest of the vegetation. And that's the only reason I used them. I'm not a, I'm not a big Excellent. fan of them either. Personally. Can you talk about where snow storage is so that um, it won't be compromising either the, the, the new vegetation or yeah. the stormwater control structures? The, the snow storage is off the edge over here okay um, there's some storage here I would I would also um, recommend that that go in the post construction maintenance plan for stormwater that winter maintenance be identified I'm sorry winter snow storage and winter maintenance be addressed as part of the post construction requirements um, I think that's getting close to all I had yeah and the, and the light fixtures are full cut off so they should not you know have Yep. Horizontal glare into the abutting property. And so I just want to draw draw to the applicant's attention in the site plan review um, ordinance G uh, number five, specifically that drainage system shall be designed so as to not impact streets, adjacent properties, downstream properties, and local soils and vegetation. The system shall also consider and incorporate upstream runoff. That may pass over the site. Has a, has has, was that included in your model, upstream runoff? There is a curb line along um, Black Point Road, mm -hmm. and the sidewalk, the newly constructed sidewalk along Black Point Road, uh, is basically the limit 
of the upstream area on that side. Okay. The site slopes in a general easterly direction, mm -hmm. as you can see from the topography. And we talked a little bit about that upstream area that's off-site <coughs> that we're handling that. Okay. And in a, um, I guess in one last editorial comment, um, looking at the um, traffic study, um, you know, that there's something sort of inherently wrong with the traffic signal. I think it's that models don't account for um, distracted driving, people sitting in traffic and waiting an extra five seconds to get going before they move through the intersection. So I'll just leave with that. And again, um, ask that the HydroCAD model be, be peer reviewed by Woodard and Kern or the town engineer. All set? Thanks. Thank you. Rachel? Yes. Um, frequently when I leave a, a meeting, uh, I end up saying, I wish I had said something. <laughs> so uh, that's how I felt after the last, uh, last version of, of taking a look at this project, and now I have a chance to say something. Uh, I recall when you first came forward, one of the one of the comments was that it's quite possible, as a matter of fact, may even be expected that the um, some of the clients for the the doctor uh, would be coming from Atria, um, and that would be a very logical assumption to make, especially if we're looking at two other perhaps medical or some sort of uh, businesses going in there. In that case, I look at the sidewalk, which ends well before uh, the access road to this property. In other words, if folks are walking from Atria to the property or to the facility, they would have to go out along Black Point Road and then turn into the property or take a car from Atria because there is really no pedestrian access from Atria to this property. And to me, it makes sense to consider a, some sort of a sidewalk system, perhaps connecting to the sidewalk on Black Point Road, which looks as though it ends just part way in, uh, to allow ease of access for the folks who are at Atria who might not want to start dodging cars as they walk to their chiropractor. So I would suggest you take, uh, take a good look at that uh, and ease of pedestrian access. If I can just comment on that particular item. If you look at that uh, image that's up there, our entrance is coming in at an area where all um, guests and visitors are actually diverted over here. So the parking in the main entry for Atria is up here. I haven't studied in particular their network of sidewalks, but I believe that a direct route would be available to come in and connect into the sidewalk that's existing along Black Point Road. And our connection to the chiropractic office is right there. So we do tie into the public sidewalk along here, and the folks that are up there would be in this area. This is more of a service area. Uh, so trying to direct someone to come along here and then down and in, I think would actually make a more circuitous route than if we actually got them into the public network and down into our connection there at the building. Then uh, I would really appreciate it if um, at the next uh, appearance to the board we could really see how that interconnection works. Yes. That would be very helpful. Yeah. I am not inclined to um, agree with your request to go to the 53 spaces. Uh, I, on the other hand, I'm um, sympathetic with the need for more, more parking spaces. And as I look at the lot and the, the schemata here, uh, there are six spaces at the very end of the parking lot at the side that seem to me uh, to be superfluous. If those six are removed, that provides more, less impervious area, and it provides more of an opportunity for some good screening. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to look at removing those and consider what sort of screening possibilities there would be uh, for the folks down below. Um, 
not just the, not just white pines. I've got several dying on my property, uh, <laughs> but um, it it provides a, an opportunity for buffer buffering. It does provide for some more parking space, but uh, I, at this point, as I said, I'm not inclined to go with the 53. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I think we've done a pretty decent job of covering storm water and traffic. Um, traffic wise, I, I would like to, um, you know, there are quite a few units at Eastern Village that are permitted that haven't been <coughs> built yet. So that's, of course, going to, I don't know if those are taken into consideration in the study or not, if they need to be, but I know Bill's. Rick, is that a job. question you'd like to, to have uh, Mr. Bray answer if, if possible? Well, I think we'll be looking. Did you take into consideration the Eastern Village? I did. Okay. I thought you would. I, knowing you, I thought you would. But I didn't see it in the so study. Just, so just for the record, um, uh, in case anyone didn't hear Mr. Bray answer, that they did take the Eastern Village permitted units into consideration. Okay. Thanks. That's good. And then the other thing I mentioned since um, we talked about looking at the, potentially looking at that timing and the, programming of that light and of course how it affects everything else but I know from having lived on that side of Scarborough bringing my son to high school in the morning that a lot of that 7 o'clock 730 traffic is teenagers um, and parents bringing their kids to school so um, it tends to back up like Susan said all the way back to that bridge in the morning now which again it's not particularly this applicant's um, problem, uh, pull, but it's if we keep adding, we go from 83 seconds to 90 seconds, and then what happens? We go to the next building goes in, we go 90 seconds to whatever it happens to be. So, anytime you increase the time there, if we could alleviate it in any way, if there's a, that'd be great. Um, that goes without saying. So, the other thing that that um, one of the folks from the condo association mentioned that we didn't really talk about was um, the lighting and their concern with the buffering. So um, I just took a quick look at sheet seven um, of the plans and it shows your lighting plan. So um, currently your lights are located near the building and facing away from the building. Um, and that's normally the way it's done. Um, but because there are residential structures right behind that back parking lot, um, I don't know if you'd consider flipping the lights so they're on the other side of the parking lot and using full cutoffs in the back so that there's no light going that way. Think about that. No, maybe. Yeah, when, when I laid it out, I had considered that. Um, yeah. The only reason they're really on the other side is because that's the snow storage as well. So right. I was trying to. Catch 22. Yeah. If you could maybe put them on a, you know, there, there are poles and structures that you could, I understand your dilemma, but you <coughs> put it on a concrete pole, for example, and lifted it up. I know there's some aesthetics involved in that, but you'd keep the snow away from the pole and it would help the condo association from getting that backlight. And there's some logistics to keep them, you know, not having to run a condo to the other side, but that can be overcome as well. Yeah. Um, um, that, that was the reasoning. All right. Well, if you, how about, uh, have you thought about, uh, is there any reason that these lights can't be dimmed after closing? Not that I'm aware of. You know, it's think, not a high crime area. It's okay. Yeah. Police stations are stone throws away. Yeah, I mean, I think, you could dim them right down to nothing, right? After closing? I think we'll, we'll talk about that and respond to that. Yeah. Okay. That should be about <clears throat> And then the last thing I'll mention is I just happened to look at the part number real quick, and, and um, you're using 4,000 Calvin color, which is fairly normal because it's a nice, white, bright light. Yeah, I usually like three. I didn't realize it was four. Um, you know, my eyes aren't that good, but the part of that part number is 40K. And on the Lithonia literature that you gave us, the 40K is okay. 4,000 Calvin. I'll double check that. My intention was to do 3,000. Yeah. Typically my preference. Yeah. So, so the, the part number on, the, like I said, my eyes aren't that great, but um, the part number. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know if it's sure. Large, large print version next time. Yeah. You're, it's um, 
LED P three four zero K TFM blah blah blah. Okay. And the um, four zero K is four thousand Cal. Okay. Thank you. So. I would think about because it's close to the residential. I'd use the three thousand Calvin, a little softer light. Absolutely agree. And you know the whole four thousand AMA thing, right? Four thousand Calvin kill causes cancer. <laughs> I don't know. It's one study. Don't <laughs> shut your, don't shut your lights up, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I have. On the, but so, I mean, if you could move the lights to the other side, but I understand you have to run conduit and stuff like that. Um, but I'd use 3,000 Calvin and, and dim them if you can. All set? Thank you. A um, lot of good comments and discussion already. Um, I'm going to try not to belabor <laughs> too much of it. Um, just uh, starting with the stormwater, um, I believe a couple of us were on the board when Atria was approved, and I seem to recall that there were a lot of discussions when that was had, when that was proposed to, from various neighbors, not necessarily the same folks, obviously, but from various neighbors talking about already having issues with water in their basements and so forth. And I say that just to say, similar to the traffic issue, that um, you know, to an extent anyway, this is kind of a pre-existing condition for some folks, and it's sometimes, particularly as I alluded to earlier. Um, tough to draw a definitive line between cause between one potential cause and and the what people perceive to be the effect so in both cases um, you know we always have to it's always a tension and a challenge for us because as others have noted we can't necessarily just can't just have the last person through the door um, pay a disproportionate price or not be able to do what they're at least theoretically permitted to do under the ordinance, provided they meet certain conditions. So, as Ms. Ogla said, that's why we have traffic impact fees. That's why we have, um, you know, we have some very rigorous local uh, stormwater standards that, um, you know, are sort of layered on top of the state standards. And um, we're fortunate to have, to have people who uh, are very aggressive about enforcing all that. Um, I would agree with um, Ms. Saunders that a peer review of HydroCAD um, does seem to be in order here, given, given some of the questions involved and in, in the location and the context. Um, I would also ask that um, staff, to the extent that it's feasible before the next time this, this um, ap applicant comes before us, if they could just, um, for the record, confirm or other uh, just generally investigate whether there are have been any um, issues known issues with the atria stormwater system um, just so that again as I alluded to earlier I, I think we have to be careful about getting too caught up in kind of anecdotal accounts and people maybe jumping to conclusions or making assumptions about things and that's not to trivialize any issues that some people may be having but I just think we have to try to be careful there um, in terms of site access, um, I, uh, you know, to the extent that there is a, a, a good quick fix that helps with the traffic light sequencing, as someone who lives at the southern end of Scarborough, I, you know, those 13 lights sometimes seem to always be <laughs> synchronized against me, uh, and I'm sure all of you have experienced that. So, um, but as others have noted, um, it's probably not going to be the magic bullet for. Uh, for this specific context, but every little bit helps. We appreciate all the detailed uh, analysis on, on traffic movements and so forth. Um, I don't think anyone, on any of my colleagues spoke to the, unless I'm forgetting, the, the notion of, of adding another flashing light uh, or sign of some sort in that area in addition to what already exists for Eastern Trail. And I know that staff had noted in their comments that there was some concern that there might be kind of signage overload at some point and it might actually just cause confusion or maybe even cause people to just be numb to it after a while. I don't know that I have a strong opinion about it one way or another. I guess my general feeling is I think it's, it's worthy of additional discussion um, with town staff as appropriate. Um, I think I personally would like to err on the side of 
people just having a heightened sense of awareness, um, and if it's something that slows them down and causes them to pause a little bit, all the better. But I do understand and appreciate the comment about you know, maybe at some point it being too much. Um, just want to make sure I'm touching on all the all the items that were discussed here. I think buffering and landscaping have been pretty well covered. Um, on parking, um, I also am am reluctant to approve uh, the 53 spaces. Uh, you know, in my experience, and just from being on this board for over 10 years now, with very rare exceptions, um, I think we end up overbuilding parking. And there there are notable exceptions, and at least one of which is a recent exception, that is that is uh, based on a more of a restaurant use and intensive restaurant use, certain types of restaurant and retail uses, um, I, I think can sometimes have extra demand for parking. Um, but I, this also leads to um, the, the notion of restricting the type of future tenants. And I do support limiting that to medical office or something along those lines, because I think this is definitely not an appropriate location for uh, for you know retail or restaurant or drive through or anything like that. Um, so given that, I would just ask that the applicant go back and revisit those parking assumptions. I don't know if there might be a, an approach where space is reserved for future build out of parking and whether that there's some somehow that that can be wordsmithed into a conditional approval. But I at the very least I would ask the applicant to give that some additional thought before you come back in front of us. Did you have something to say yes, to that? I do. I do. Nancy? I wanted to catch you, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, the specific reason for the six spaces per thousand is based on an anticipated medical type use. The need for that is being seen in the market because of the changing way that appointments are being scheduled so that there's an overlap. And so what happens is the demands for uh, uh, medical office type uses are seeing that need that's more in the six spaces per thousand. So it's the intent of marketing to a medical office need that drives that. And I know from the applicant's own um, uh, center itself, his staggered scheduled appointments are such that he needs the, the ratio as well. So it's not that we're trying to overbuild. It's not that we're trying to do the what if. It's based on what we are seeing for the targeted tenant that we're looking for in this building. And so we don't want to build a site that has a parking deficiency and then not be able to get to the tenants that we'd like to see that would complement this type of use. All right, well, I appreciate that. Uh, again, I, 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 have, I think the board has heard similar things from other applicants in the past. And then we end up with a lot of extra impervious surface. I just uh, would just ask that you Give that some additional thought, we and we'll will. see where we land going forward on that. But that's my my personal position on that. Um, just very quickly, um, architecture from what I've seen looks fine. Um, I I like the overall design from what I've seen of it, and the the, the mix of different materials is appealing. Um, and uh, we will look at that in more detail going forward. But beyond that, I think. Hopefully, the next steps are clear for all involved, and we <coughs> thanks again to the public for the comments, uh, both uh, uh, verbal and written, and um, we will look forward to seeing this next time. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on, item number five, Contour Properties LLC requests a subdivision amendment review for 8 Science Park, Assessor's Map, R77, Lot 3B. Jay? We'll let folks clear out here, but we have to... All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you noted, uh, this application is on the agenda for a subdivision amendment. Um, the application materials sort of reference the request for site plan and subdivision. 
Um, and as staff went through the materials, there seemed to be there's some confusion in trying to draw out what really the request was seeking. And we believe the written materials are still a bit murky in that regard. Staff has had the benefit of a sit down meeting with the applicant as well as a couple of phone conversations. So we feel like we have a pretty good understanding of what's being sought and that there is a fairly straightforward pathway to get there. Um, and so I think what I'd like to do is, you know, give you the quick zoning context and then um, really ask the applicant to sort of just walk through sort of what it is they're precisely looking for. Um, again, if I didn't mention already, this property is in the BOR zone, business office residential, um, as well as uh, has some shoreland overlay district um, that is also uh, applicable. Um, and so I think with that, as I said, I'm going to keep my intro fairly short and let the applicants sort of walk the board through what the request is and, and staff's here to answer questions along the way. So I think that's all we got for now. And turn over to the applicant. Great. Thanks very much. <clears throat> my name is Mike Tadamo Wieland. I'm a civil engineer with Terradine Consultants. I'm here with Bob Goudreau and Bill Beschenstein from Contour Properties. They're the applicant on this. Uh, Science Park subdivision um, is located at the uh, northern end of Route 1 in Scarborough. Um, we were here back in June reviewing a site plan for Lot 2 of that subdivision. But let me take you back um, a little ways and give you a little of the, the background on the subdivision itself. Uh, so Science Park subdivision, the, the original subdivision plan is here in front of you. Uh, it's uh, about 17 and a quarter acres. It was originally approved by the planning board back in 1978. And there are six lots uh, included in that subdivision. This corner lot here, which is, this is the corner of uh, Route 1 and Science Park Road. And this, this is the existing elevation center today. I believe it was at the old Conica building that was referred to as. So the old Conica building as your, was not part of that original subdivision. So lot one, two, three, four, five, six uh, was the original subdivision. So back in 1978, uh, the Foundation for Blood Research developed lot one, which is here. Um, and within a couple years, had outgrown that building, I believe. And, sold it and developed Lot 2 for its facility. So Lot 2 uh, was the site of the Foundation for Blood Research from about 1980 until, I believe, 2016 or 17. Um, and Lot 1 is the, is the location of the existing medical office building today. So today, what exists is Science Park Road, Lot 1 is developed, Lot 2 is developed, uh, and Lots 3 through 6 have not been developed, so they remain uh, in a forested condition undeveloped today. Like I mentioned earlier, we were here in June to review uh, site plan amendment for Lot 2, uh, which was the, the most recently the Foundation for Blood Research building. Uh, that's been um, the site plan amendment was approved back in June for an expansion uh, and a conversion into uh, a medical office use. So what the applicants are seeking from the board now is uh, a subdivision amendment. And like Jay mentioned, we provided a lot of information uh, in the packet. Um, but what we're asking for in the, in the short term is uh, the applicant's looking to create a condominium here, a commercial condominium. Lot one is, is not uh, under control of the applicant. That's owned by others. So what, what is proposed is for lots uh, two, three, four, five, six, and Science Park Road to be combined into a single lot, and a commercial con condominium will be created. So I'll change over to the, what is a proposed 
plan. So the proposed the proposed plan includes sort of the shortening of Science Park Road, and this is a this is a private road today that'll be maintained as a private road, but a shorter to a shorter uh, extent, and that will continue to provide frontage for lot one of the subdivision, which again is owned by others. Uh, and, and really needs Science Park Road for frontage because it does not front on, on Route 1 itself. Uh, lot 2 has amended site plan approval. The, this will contain uh, two condominium units. They're labeled number uh, 2 and 2A. Two uh, again, those buildings are existing and have site plan approval. Uh, and then in the future, uh, site plan approval will be sought for units three, four, and five. And we've, we've gone through the process of developing uh, site plans. I'll call them conceptual site plans, but there's quite a bit of work and detail was put into them. Uh, we don't have building architecture yet because the buildings have not been designed, so that's the primary reason we're not seeking site plan approval for those at this point. Lot three is uh, is uh, anticipated to be about a 36,000 square foot medical office use with associated parking, utility infrastructure, stormwater management, landscaping, etc. Uh, unit four is anticipated to be about 3,200 square foot general office and lot five, or I'm sorry, unit five of the condo will be approximately 4,500 square feet, uh, again, general office. Um, so in the short term, uh, sort of Infrastructure improvements will include a sidewalk that will be constructed along Science Park Road. Currently, there's, there's no sidewalk along Science Park Road. Uh, and utilities, there are existing uh, water and sewer uh, mains in Science Park Road. They currently end at Unit 2, so those will be extended up to Unit 3, and new services will be uh, installed for the <coughs> units four and five in the future. Uh, in addition to uh, approvals from this board, the project will also require uh, a, a traffic movement permit from DOT. That's in process. The scoping meeting has been held, uh, and the, the report or the study will be submitted uh, in, the, in the coming days, uh, possibly by the end of the week this week. Uh, and eventually the project will also require a, uh, a stormwater permit from the DEP. The way we've designed the stormwater management in the, in the plans you have in front of you is a sort of a site-by-site a site um, site design. So, for instance, Unit 3 has its own uh, subsurface sand filter. Uh, unit 2 and 2A, uh, our stormwater is collected in an underdrain soil filter that, again, that's already been reviewed and approved. Uh, and then units 4 and 5 also um, handle their own stormwater runoff. So this isn't a case of sort of a, a traditional subdivision where you're collecting all, all the stormwater runoff from the entire thing and, and sending it down to a common wet pond or something like that. So we're asking that stormwater be reviewed as part of the site plan review on a, on a sort of a unit by unit um, basis as those designs come forward. And as soon as the, the threshold for, um, for the DEP permit is triggered, the project will go to DEP. For that permit. So uh, again, we've thrown a lot at you in the in the plans that were submitted and in the application materials. 
uh, and we certainly welcome any any feedback you have on the individual site plans. Um, but in the short term, what we're asking for is the subdivision amendment, which would uh, sort of do away with uh, the existing lot lines on lots two through six, combine them, and allow the applicant to, to condominiumize uh, the different units. So, um, so with that, we're um, happy to answer any questions you might have and, and get any feedback that you, you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'd have the opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone? Same rules apply, five minutes or less. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll just note that while we wait for anyone who may wish to get up, uh, the board did receive a letter prior to the previous meeting that was, uh, you know, in, in that is part of the public record um, from actually the owner of the one lot of the subdivision. So I just want to be sure that that's noted. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that reminder. All right. Seeing none, we'll go to the board. Um, Robin, do you want to start this? Time? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to limit my comments to stormwater. And um, first of all, I applaud you for two things. Um, one is your format. I love how you put your peak runoffs. I'm looking at specifically page six of your stormwater report. I really appreciate that you put the percent increases and you play things out so practically. The second thing I want to commend you for is going on a site by site basis. Um, it's that's really the best, you know, sort of treat it at the source instead of conveying it to this, uh, you know, this huge, you know. Anyway, the point of my, I, I guess. Putting the two together, though, Mike, I'm just wondering on page six of your report, how you got to the seven percent increases. Did you do like a weighted average of the percent increase for the entire condo area, or have you done a site-by-site -site analysis to find out what the amount? Yeah, so so we didn't. We, we did. We treat this as sort of an aggregate site. Yep. We, we look at the entire site. And are, are you talking about? Can you? Be a little more specific. Yeah, I don't so have you, it in front of me. When you right said now, um, on page six, when you said your pre development versus post development for, say, two years, there was a 7% increase, 10 years is a 4.7, right. and 25 is a 3% increase. And I'm wondering, is it over the entire parcel and it's not evaluated based on each individual unit? Correct, yeah. So our, our analysis is, was, is, that's a pre-development versus post-development comparison. The pre-development um, was the the condition prior to the the uh, revisions to this unit two and two A area because there was an increase in the yeah. pervious area there. Um, so the, the pre-development condition was prior to that, and the post-development condition is the full build out. So. And I guess all I'm trying to ask is, have you done any analysis on? For example, unit five and unit four, you know, four to see it, what the percent increases to see if it's like just one specific unit that's causing the increase. Understood, and it's it's not the the answer is not. We we did look at that quite a bit, and and we feel like we've done. And Karen has a copy of the report for you, so you can go to flip yeah, page six. Um, we did study that, and we. Uh, where you'll remember that um, there was a, a small increase in the peak flows mm -hmm. as a result of the, the site plan approval for units 2 and 2A, which is lot 2 in the subdivision. Mm -hmm. And when we went through the analysis of, for the entire parcel, uh, it became very difficult to sort of overcome that. So, so this area, the area of development for units three, four, and five today are undeveloped, right? They're they're wooded. Um, so there's not a lot of runoff coming off those areas. In the post-development <laughs> condition, we've provided as much storage as possible, really, to the extent that there's almost nothing coming out of that sand filter uh, in the 25-year storm. Um, and likewise, there's almost nothing 
contributing to peak flows from these small, sort of relatively small developments um, for units four and five. And again, the study point is the Nunsuch River, um, which is several hundred feet sort of to the, to the north, I guess. Um, so really the, the increase is coming from, it's coming from unit uh, two, unit two and two A, I believe. Okay. And, and again, we, at, at the time we designed that, we maximized, we really maximized the volume of storage in that under drain soil filter to, to try to reduce the increase as much as possible. And we, we feel like we've done sort of as much as feasible given, uh, I guess, a, a number of factors, including yeah, and you're not in the floodplain zone at all. You're not in the flood zone at no, all. No, the flood okay. the flood zone actually doesn't extend onto this okay. this site. It's just so low lying there. It's difficult. All right, I guess I'm I'm looking at Angela. Let me just check with Angela real quick to to see if she's on board with this approach to sort of looking at it at a unit by unit basis versus an overall overall net kind of a thing. Are you on board with that, or do you have well, I think the original, when you're here previously with the, the last project, which is uh, being constructed, um, we talked about the issues and we went around and around with stormwater a little bit and looking at it as um, we'd have more opportunities, I guess, as we kind of move through and each lot um, and I guess a little of both, I think. I think we're going to have to look at each. Yeah. individual but then also at each point say check in kind of where we're at I guess if that makes sense I, I would agree with that I, I I'm not proposing that we that we I'm I, as we move forward and develop the different units mm -hmm. I, I I still think it's prudent to to look to study the site as one right. complete site yeah um, but you know, it, say unit three comes along next. I think we 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 probably look at that the design of that system, um, and 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 what does that do to the the stormwater coming off the entire site? So I, when I say we look at it on a, yeah. a a unit by unit basis, I say we sort of uh, what I'm saying is we we analyze what the design of those units is doing to the entire site as Perfect. we tackle those. It's things. a very challenging site as far as yeah. stormwater is concerned, so I, I appreciate you sort of thinking outside of the box. It's very much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, um, just on that sort of that theme of, you know, the, the bigger picture versus site by site, this might be a good point to uh, put staff on the spot and, and see if uh, they could give us a little bit of direction on or clarification on the threshold, the threshold or thresholds that the board should be focused on given what specifically is being sought tonight in terms of subdivision amendment approval because I think it gets a little confusing in reading through the materials and then also listening. I mean, it's helpful detail, but then there are references to the project and I think Sometimes it, it, it's hard to kind of keep focused on what is it that specifically we are being tasked with potentially acting on tonight. I don't know whether we'll get there or not versus things that are going to be further into the weeds when we're actually doing looking at site plan approval for specific sites. Sure, happy to sort of chime in and I think, yeah, that, that, that's part of the confusion is what exactly is the ask? Is it you know, is this the development pattern that we're asking for and, you know, sort of the, the build-out scenario that we're planning for and then the subdivision amendment plan, Yeah, you know, I guess the easiest way to sort of look at this is really to take this in a very stepped approach in that a subdivision amendment plan, as it was already noted, if we look at the 1978 approved plan, we have an approved private way with six approved commercial lots that but for the fact that they want to turn this into a condominium, a developer would come along, five separate developers would come along and build out the remaining five lots under our site plan review. This current property owner wants to make a, what I think is actually a fairly simple subdivision amendment. It's really reducing the road, the, the right of way, um, by some couple hundred feet, you know, whatever that number is and then merging the lots. 
but ostensibly it doesn't really change the access pattern into the lot. So I really think the subdivision amendment is actually, quite frankly, a very simple, maybe two or three plan sheets and a little narrative that <laughs> clarifies that. Um, and I think where we got confused along the way was trying to articulate then the further development pattern and look at these site plan elements, but not really giving quite all the information. And so to try to parse it all, to pull it all apart was difficult. So I think there is an opportunity to do a subdivision amendment that's pretty straightforward. As I said, a, you know, project narrative, a couple of sheets, the old plan, the proposed plan, and that can be sort of the end of the subdivision amendment process. Then we will get into, you know, we talked about a sketch plan. Eventually, you know, we're going to need to take a look at uh, uh, access off of Route 1. I think we talked about the left-hand turn pocket. We know that was an issue when, when Konica came along, the redevelopment which uh, the developer was part of, that, you know, that left-hand turn pocket is something that's really going to need to get vetted and ironed out. And I think that's, again, where the developer was doing a good job in trying to say, well, here, here is my vision for the future. Here will be my impact. So in a lot of ways, being helpful, and, and informative, but then at the same time, making it just too too confusing. So, um, in terms of what's being sought tonight, I think if the board really just thinks about this in terms of merging five lots and the reduction of a couple hundred feet of that private way, um, you know, giving some general guidance around is that because I should mention basically what that will this will become is a unified development. Um, in our in our ordinance, we have a defined item called the unified development, and that's what this will simply become. And I think we, you know, staff can work with the applicant's engineer on what those plan notes and plan modifications would look like, and we could come forward with a, as I said, that simplified subdivision amendment plan. And then, if there are any subsequent site plan amendments that, or site plans that they want to do at the outset, that could be a separate and distinct application that's its own packet of materials. Um, and so then we work our way sequentially through. Um, so thank you. I hope that helps yeah. somewhat. Response. Um, I really like that idea. It's much simpler. I, I stopped reading it. <laughs> I, I simply couldn't follow it. So I think that's a brilliant idea. The only question I have is things such as landscaping, mm -hmm. OK? There's landscaping that's going to be affecting the whole site mm -hmm. as opposed to landscaping that's going to affect individual sites. There's a waving of the hand. Can you speak to this? I don't know. You're in charge of who speaks when. Go up. Come on up. This is uh, Bob Goudreau, one of the owners of um, Contour Properties, and that's working on the development. This is my fourth condominium of an, uh, commercial space. And what we've come to find is that we've put the master plan together so everybody knows where we're going, the road, the utilities, all that are in and, and approved. And then we move on to getting individual approvals per lot, come back with individual landscape plans per lot so that everything gets reviewed down line. But I can go out to my market now and advertise that this lot of unit or lot three is available and it can fit a 36,000 square foot building. It may not be the shape and size that you see on the plan today. We've set aside 36,000, but let's say they come not as a medical user, but as an office user. They still could have 36,000. It might be spread out a little bit, but they have to come in and still meet all the current demands of this, this um, zoning and uh, planning. So it's a master plan that I can move forward with at this point, and that, I think Jay gave it to you as there's a big chip picture but there will become minor pictures as we move forward. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it didn't right. answer my question but I've decided that by the time I, it's important to ask the question we'll have some answers. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Okay. So so I do think though that does raise a question in, in staff's you know because <laughs> recognizing where the developer wants to go with that response is to have sort of pre-marketable lots of say 36,000 square that's where then getting into the traffic analysis I think is important at the outset and that's the bit of information that we haven't been provided yet so if that's so I think we can get if, if they want to make this subdivision 
amendment process sort of to that level, we can certainly get there, but then there's more information that's going to be needed to be provided. <coughs> I believe, if I'm not mistaken, did we have a, we had a meeting with the DOT. It's been many months at this point, but I feel, I, I seem to recall that that was this project and my others, but um, so, you know, again, I think staff can work with the applicant and, and their engineer and sort of figure out what it is that we want to get to, what are those pertinent pieces of information, right? Landscaping <coughs> along the right-of-way might be one thing. Landscaping window lots, probably not needed at this point, um, so. All right, thank you. So, Jay, just a quick question. So, all we're talking about tonight is allowing contour to merge all those lots into one, right? That's all, the, that's all they're asking for tonight is can they make five think, lots into one? I think it would be staff's recommendation that it's a bit unclear of what the exact ask is and that there be a, a, a repackaging of the materials. Because okay. if they are just looking to merge the lots, that would be one thing, but we don't have a plan that then, yeah. so there's going to be need, to, there's going to need to be revisions to the plan no matter what happens, so we might as well get that done, and I think we can come back to the board for a potential subdivision amendment. That's a one meeting item, De but again, it depends on the level of complexity that we're trying to get to, and I think that's where the... I just want to make sure I wasn't the only one that didn't know what he was doing, yeah. what he was being asked to do. Yeah, and if I may. So what's shown on the plans in front of you is, is essentially what uh, the applicants want to build out. And frankly, if we had architecture for these buildings or, or if architecture wasn't part of the review, we would be seeking site plan approval for the entire thing. <clears throat> and should someone come along and want to want to change something, uh, it, it, we would be seeking an amendment, a site plan amendment at that point. That would have been the approach we would have liked to have taken. But it became, staff made it pretty clear that without architecture, site plan approval for any or all of the proposed units is off the table. So that that's why you have in front of you sort of the wealth of information that, that would lead you towards the site plan review. That said, where the applicant, as you heard from the applicant, they do sort of see this level of development, and this is what they want, would like to uh, go to the market and advertise. So the traffic, the, the traffic process, the process with, with DOT is in process. There was a scoping meeting held. Uh, Bill Bray is the consultant working on that. And we expect that to go to DOT, his report to go to DOT in the, in the next week or so. So we do expect to come back and have that. Uh, and tonight, frankly, we're not asking tonight to just merge lots. I, I think there is, there is a next step to that. And we, we certainly will provide uh, some clarification on that um, in the form of maybe a simplified plan set and a, and a more clear cover letter like Jay mentioned. The other thing that, um, that we'll be providing is some draft condominium documents um, that are going to largely uh, mimic the, the plan that's in front of you. So we'll talk about sort of the five, five proposed uh, condominium units and what their responsibilities are with maintenance uh, and limited common elements and common elements and so on and so forth. So. Um, Again, any feedback the board has on that tonight, we're welcome to take that and, and use that in, in the next, uh, sort of that next step. And then I think when someone, when, when someone comes along and wants to develop one of these units and we have an actual building, an actual building architecture, then we'll be coming back for review of the site plan elements for each individual unit. So sorry to con confuse the process. Here, uh, I think if nothing else, we got. I think we've kind of gotten our heads around mm -hmm. the ask a little better, and sure. kind of hopefully everyone on both sides has a better understanding of what needs to happen next. Great. Uh, given that, are there other comments or questions in terms of direction or feedback to the applicant, Rachel? 
And I'd, I'd just like to compliment you for approaching the Scarborough Land Trust with those wetlands. Um, really appreciate that, given their closeness to the Nunsuck. Yeah, I think it's, it would be natural for them to to take ownership uh, of that um, and protect it. And uh, the applicants, they, they continue to be in discussion with them. So hopefully, um, hopefully the, the land trust will accept it. Also, okay. anything else? Okay. With Thank that, you very much. we will see you next time. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to propose that we take a very brief break, like two or three minutes, and then we'll come back and try to power through the last couple items on this agenda. So you'll get a new Thank you. You just why I these mics are hot.
Five star policy. Sorry, excuse me. We're we're uh, we're getting started, folks. Thank you. Excuse us. Thank you. Uh, number six on the agenda: Five Stars Holdings LLC requests a subdivision review for a conservation subdivision at 48 Mitchell Hill Road, Assessor's Map R10, Lot Five. Jay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is for a residential subdivision in the RF or Rural Farming District, and it does meet um, the standards for a required conservation subdivision in that it has more than an acre of wetlands on the site. Uh, therefore, the applicant, as I just noted, is required to go through those conservation subdivision design standards, which ostensibly require it's a density neutral approach to um, development pattern in that the typical number of lots that would be typically uh, allowed in the RF district at uh, 80,000 square feet and 200 feet of frontage are still allowed. However, the lot sizes are allowed to be reduced um, in consideration of at least 50% of the land being maintained as open space and the preservation of wetlands and water courses is really the predominant um, uh, element that's sought. Um, so with that, you will have received a host of staff comments. Well, actually just uh, comments from staff as well as from our um, uh, traffic peer reviewer. Um, one of the items that we noted and had a discussion around uh, was the amount of disturbed area uh, associated with the project. The applicant had previously noted or in their submissions noted that there was going to be less than an acre of disturbance. Mm -hmm. In subsequent discussions that we've had, um, they are, I think they've sort of looked at it, reconsidered, and note that there will be greater than an acre of total disturbance. Um, therefore, that triggers a sort of separate or uh, a higher level of subject, uh, storm water review. Um, they sort of have to meet controls in terms of uh, Chapter 500. DEP Chapter 500, so that'll be elements that um, will need to come forward um, as the, the <coughs> plans progress. Um, we'll note that this was before you for a sketch plan back in October. At that time, the board had uh, indicated that a wetland peer review would be a good idea, and so that was accomplished. Uh, the Cumberland County, uh, folks from Cumberland County Soil Water Conservation District did that for us. Um, and you'll should have received those comments as well. Um, so then just going through our staff comments, a couple of things we noted are just ensuring that you know there's adequacy of setbacks from the, the wetlands um, and the on-site streams, discussion about the future ownership of the open space, as well as um, uh, consideration for access management, potential for shared driveways, and ensuring that there's adequacy adequacy of site distances. Um, I think those were the main elements that we wanted to touch on. Did I miss anything? No? Okay. That, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jay. And at this point, I'd like to recuse myself from the proceedings, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill Thompson, project manager with BH2M Engineers. Uh, Jay gave an introduction um, indicating we're, we're here for Five Star Holdings, uh, the developer uh, for a nine lot uh, subdivision, Mitchell Hill Estates. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's on 28 and a half acres in the IRF zone, as shown on the highlighted drawing. Uh, it is a conservation subdivision, <coughs> um, which is what we've reflected here. We've done the net residential calculations, the drawing at the lower end of the easel reflects what a nine lot subdivision would look like as a conventional uh, project to show that a, a nine lot conventional project would work on the 28 acres. <clears throat> Our net residential caps again just uh, just slightly exceed the nine lots uh, in the nine of what we are proposing. There is one existing uh, house on what is on lot six uh, on the frontage of Mitchell Hill Road uh, that will be obviously part of the of the subdivision. Um, we've divided this out, the uh, minimum lot size, 30,000 square feet. They all exceed that. We have frontages anywhere from 102 feet to 140 uh, on the nine lots. All the lots will have uh, their own septic and well. We've completed two test pits on each lot as was required and is shown on this drawing. 
Open space for um, conservation subdivision, you have to have at least 50% of the project set aside as open space. We have 19.5 acres, which is just under 69%, so we've exceeded that. And we feel the project fits in and works, works nicely with that uh, open space. Uh, we had the wetlands uh, completed, which are highlighted in a little bit of a darker green in the center. <clears throat> and the peer review came back with a couple of, couple of tweaks, but nothing significant. And this plan does reflect uh, the peer review uh, wetlands. The uh, site also uh, has, at the very northern end here, there's a, a perennial stream which we've shown, and we've shown 75-foot setback from that, and it does not impact uh, Lot 9's buildable area at all. Also came back on the uh, peer review of a couple of intermittent uh, streams. They're not shown on your submission, but we did uh, locate them, and there's three of them just on this north or northwesterly boundary. Uh, they barely come back onto our site, uh, and that'll be in our next submission. You'll be able to see the, the impact or no impact uh, from our development, but it was asked that we we show them and see what impact there might be. We're going to have uh, obviously driveways coming out onto Mitchell Hill Road. Um, kind of the, I'd say the beauty of this piece is uh, site distance is not an issue. Lots one and nine, we were asked to review uh, the site distance on those to make sure, and we exceed uh, 360 feet and 350 feet uh, from lot one and nine, which, which were the two in question, and they exceed the uh, requirement for driveways. Uh, lot five and six will have a combined driveway. The uh, house on the front, the driveway just tweaks across the corner of lot five. So we are going to do a shared driveway uh, for lot five and six. But the other lot, at our last meeting, we talked about uh, shared driveways. And we said, well, you know, they really don't work well. It becomes issues with, <clears throat> with your neighbor and plowing. So what we've agreed, and I think the board was, uh, was looking favorably at that, is each lot, a driveway would be developed with a little bit of a turnaround uh, when they come out of the garage so they, nobody's backing out on the Mitchell Hill Road. So everybody can turn around on their property and then come out and obviously a lot safer. But the, again, the site distances uh, work really well. It is a posted 35 mile an hour zone. Uh, so we feel like, <clears throat> well, we do. We, we, we've exceeded the, uh, the requirement that the ordinance has. Uh, Jay mentioned a little bit about the uh, uh, stormwater. Um, the site drains um, from Mitchell Hill Road. Everything drains. What my lighter? Everything drains off into the sort of westerly, southwesterly, uh, from Mitchell Hill Road, uh, which which is nice because this area uh, helps mitigate any any uh, stormwater that might be coming off these sites. But we do want to recognize uh, and try to work with the one acre uh, of uh, total disturbance. That doesn't keep you. It keeps you from going into a high level, higher level stormwater. The applicant will not be building any home. They're going to sell lots, so this could have you know this one existing house. This could have eight builders in here. So what we'd like to do, and we think we can work with that, <clears throat> is the one acre of uh, disturbance that would be allowed under the the lower stormwater level, if you will, is to allocate an equal portion to eight lots. I mean, lot six is, uh, is developed. There's no more disturbance required. So what we'd like to do is take that 43,560 square feet and allocate it equally to the eight lots. We can put notes on the plan, which is about 5,445 square feet of disturbance. Um, our homeowner docks, uh, if they're going to do a, a one-level ranch-style home, uh, we're talking about a minimum of 1,300 square feet. So with 55, let's call it 54, 5,500 square feet of disturbance with a 1,300 square foot house with the driveway and septic, we feel we can work with it. And what we would do is obviously have notes on the plan. And if a builder came in and, and had to or needed to exceed that based on site conditions, um, they would then be uh, required to meet the, the higher level of stormwater improvements, which might mean a drip edge on the home or uh, a buffer. I mean, we've got sort of an ideal situation, if you will, on the backs of these lots um, where, where grades are coming off in this direction is if we did exceed it or if one of the builders did, um, then that could be, could be accomplished. <clears throat> um, just going to get down through, we, we did get a memo from uh, Jamel's office. Um, these issues, uh, I just want to highlight on them, they're not responded to yet on the plans, but we obviously will. 
Uh, there was an error on the setbacks. We had 10 foot sides to the rear setbacks. It should be 15. Uh, that's an easy fix. And again, on the, I talked a little bit about the stormwater, but with the, with the grading and the driveways and the houses, we're really going to try to work um, so that we're not triggered into a higher level uh, stormwater permit. The intermittent streams will be shown on the final plans. Uh, the 25 foot setback, we, we have no wetland impacts, which, which is nice, kind of unique. Uh, and on the backs of these lots here, we do have a 25-foot setback uh, from the wetland, and those can be uh, delineated in the field with uh, pins with a buffer a notation on them. Um, Jamel asked for a, a date <coughs> on the drawing of when the wetlands were done and when the peer review was done, uh, which we can do. The wetland consultant uh, that for my client um, obviously did the wetlands and found no uh, characteristics to support vernal pool. Um, it was done in August. Obviously, that's not the vernal pool season. But in order to have a, um, a concern about a vernal pool, you need the characteristics. A vernal pool is a is a obviously it's in a wetland. It's a depressed um, uh, topography with no inlet and no outlet. So that was reviewed as part of our wetland study. So if we don't have the characteristics for a vernal pool, um, we don't. We don't feel like we need to wait till spring um, to review that because because it was looked at for the potential in August. Uh, open space will be left in its natural state. There will be a homeowners association form just to manage should they want to do any walk, walking trails or if something needed uh, attention, there would be a homeowners association form. We talked about the shared driveways. Five and six will be the only lot that we're proposing that on. Uh, site distance was measured using the eye height of 3.75 feet coming out of the lot and the object approaching at 4.25 and again lot one had or lot one had 350 um, and lot nine had 360 which again exceeds the the ordinance requirement uh, there was another detail on the construction plan for uh, inlet protection on the culvert each driveway will require a culvert which will be uh, directed by the public works Recreation fees will be paid by the individual lot owner where the applicant is not going to be building. Uh, we are going to uh, propose a fire tank uh, for fire protection. Uh, we're in talks with the fire department and the proper uh, uh, person that uh, is responsible for that. Um, again, in part of Jamel's uh, memo, it's just all the town standard notes, which obviously can be added to the final plan. And you know, we had a couple of typos on some book and pages, just some. Uh, minor adjustments on that so um, we feel like you know we're, we're in good shape here uh, like I said uh, it, I think it's a it's a project that fits well with what you're looking for for a conservation subdivision so with that I'll answer any questions you might have right, thank you um, first we do have the opportunity for public comment um, in case anyone wasn't here before uh, we just ask that anyone who has anything to say come on up give your name and address Limit your comments to five minutes or less. Try to avoid being too uh, repetitive with anything that might have, been, might have been said before. And please direct your comments to the board and, and not the applicant. So with that, we'll open it up. Good evening. Wallace Spengler, 233 Holmes Road in Scarborough. I owned most of the land around there, so I have an intimate knowledge of it. As far as those streams, I was the one that questioned that, and that resulted in the peer review. And there's one year-round stream with a 36-inch culvert going under, home, uh, under Mitchell Hill Road, and three intermittent streams. But down in this right-hand corner, uh, which I be, believe would be southeast. It doesn't show on that one, but on the map that was submitted, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, their contour lines, uh, there's like six or seven of them very closely spaced together. And I helped Steve Ross place the pin down in the bottom of that ravine, and that is a permanent waterway. It's not shown, and I checked with the uh, 
Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, and she said that she didn't go that far because she thought that the boundary line was over further off of that area. So there, it doesn't make any difference as far as the number of acres of wetland goes, but there is another stream there. So I'd like to comment on a few areas. I, I kind of thought that everything was bunched together and then I found out that Timber Sands Drive that's right across the street from me has the same standards and the spacing there is okay. But what's happening is that our water table is dropping and my well's gone dry several times. The uh, person that lives across the street from me, Roger Hillett, has had to drill another well. There's people in the neighborhood that have had to drill as much as four or five wells. And there's a difference between Timber Sands Drive, that's all sand over there, and what's over on this side uh, on Mitchell Hill Road is not the same material. So you might think that, well, with all that wetland, you're gonna get more water for your well, but that's not the case. So uh, I'm concerned about um, the water table and the fact that there is no public water or sewer there. The other, uh, one of the other things that I'd like to mention is that uh, the applicant is stating that all the uh, water drains off towards the back, towards the wetland. And if you look at the map, I think you've got to see the map. The contour lines coming down Mitchell Hill Road, a lot of them are facing towards Mitchell Hill Road. If you look at lot one, there's contour lines that face towards the road. When you get to lot two, it's not quite so bad. When you get to lot three, there's ones facing the road. So you're going to get some runoff from those lots onto the road. And if you look at the uh, contour lines going down Mitchell Hill Road, you'll see that they're closely spaced together because there's quite a hill going down there. And on the other side of that hill towards Holmes Road, the water actually goes out onto the road and has washed away part of the shoulder down where Steve Peters lives. And in the wintertime, that water that's going on the road freezes. So it will be very important to have adequate ditching along the road to prevent that from happening. I want to just check one more thing. I looked at the letter from BHB and that letter stated that there were seven residential lots and that there were no streams. And yet we found five streams. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Fengler, and I live at 6 Mitchell Hill Road in Scarborough, and I'm one of the abutters to this project. I, um, I have a few comments. Um, I do uh, recognize the um, sort of uh, recommended build-out with not being a conserved or open space development, and I do see that, you know, we the uh, applicant has tried to... Um, match that in his desires to, you know, develop nine lots. Um, the concern I have is, suppose, would be that <clears throat> I do feel that we're going to try to, that it is, while we're trying to protect the open space, the uh, proposed development or nine lots does sort of not, is not quite in sync with the rural character of Mitchell Hill Road and, and, the, and the abutters on 
Fengler and Freedom Road. And I, I do recognize that there's certainly a balance to be struck between open space and uh, uncompact, compact um, development. But if you look at most of these neighbors, you know, have 200 foot lots or 200 feet of frontage or more. And, you know, this definitely does seem to be compressed quite a bit. Um, I do have um, a little intimate knowledge of the area myself, having grown up and work, working in this area, both <coughs> comments on sight lines and comments on water uh, availability. Um, I don't believe that it's featured on this diagram, but I, one of my current plowing customers, I believe, would be a neighbor to Michael and Lynn Mulkernan. Um, I plow for a, a, a former employee, Cody Power, so I think is a, an abutter or next door to that. And I pull in and back out onto Mitchell Hill Road, and there is, as my father alluded to, you know, there's quite a drop that comes down from the top of where, where Fengler Road comes out onto Mitchell Hill Road before you hit this dip and gully and then head back up to the top of Mitchell Hill Road. And I do worry myself, and I back out onto Mitchell Hill Road of getting clipped by someone descending rapidly from either direction. <clears throat> so I do think that it would be important that we see that these people, if, if, if the future build out is these nine you know, consolidated lots with small frontages on Mitchell Hill Road, that we do um, see that they do have turnarounds in their driveway and are allowed to enter onto that road in a forward facing position. <clears throat> I think that's for their safety as well as those who are traveling on Mitchell Hill Road. And I'm not sure how you would, uh, you know, build that into the requirements of the individual builders that would then develop these homes. Um, one of the other things that was mentioned by my father was about water concerns. Um, I have worked for a number of um, homeowners in, uh, I believe it's Mitchell Hill Heights, which is comprised of Fengler Road and Freedom Road. And I have, which are, you know, further removed from these properties, but I have had uh, a client, uh, Ryan and his, Miles and his wife, who are, have drilled two wells, are in the process of considering drilling a third well in order to get the water they need for their household needs. Um, another person um, just down the road from Peter Ham, oh, excuse me, closer to Holmes Road, um, Tammy and Troy Locke are in the process of building a home, and in doing so, they had to drill a well so deep that they ended up hitting salt water and are now having to deal with an expensive treatment system. Um, this summer, I helped a family on Peregrine Way at the top of Mitchell Hill Road to install a lawn, and in and also I helped with the installation of an ir irrigation system there. And while that may not be our most pressing needs is irrigating our lawns as, as much as, you know, flushing toilets, taking showers, and drinking, um, we tried to do so only to help them get a lawn established, but we took the maximum amount of time allotted in a 24-hour period and stretched out their watering needs throughout the day with, you know, short durations, built-in breaks for the well to develop, I mean, you know, to, to recharge. And I did the maximum amount, and we still bottomed out and could not pro keep their water supply. And this is using, you know, and I've been doing this for a long time, the most, you know, nozzles that only use a gallon and a half per minute. You know, most of the gallon toilets that we flush with, you know, use uh, two or three gallons. Uh, shower heads most likely consume more than a gallon and a half per minute. Granted, you know, we're not taking showers all day long, but these folks were, you know, very concerned about whether they were going to have to drill another well. So burdening the aquifer with nine homes uh, does put an additional strain not only for those individual homeowners, but certainly their, their neighbors and their butters. And I do wonder if perhaps, you know, a smaller uh, reduced number of lots and a reduced number of homes might be more prudent. Um, being a landscaper, I'm keenly aware of square footages, installing lawns, sodding lawns, seeding lawns. Uh, if the, um, the developers of this property are, are looking at parsing out 45,000 square feet 
Um, so the individual builders of lots one through nine have 5,000 square feet of land to deal with for disturbance purposes. Um, now that's a pretty small lawn by itself. And that 5,000 square feet is going to also include a driveway, uh, a septic system, and the actual footprint of the building itself. I find that very, you know, I'm not convinced that that's possible, to be honest with you. I mean, I installed paver driveways in Portland, and those are pretty small driveways. Um, six or 800 square feet is a tiny, tiny driveway. So, you know, that's, you know, these, are, these driveways, I would imagine, would be 1,000 square feet, you know, 1,200, 1,500 square feet, just in driveways alone. And then, of course, like I said, this, the footprint of the home, whatever lawn area, septic system, so on. So I think that's something that's definitely um, is something to be looked at. And again, if we shift the focus on to the individual builders to monitor that 5,000 square feet and we've not done the appropriate evaluation of stormwater on the bigger scale, you know, will we be policing it on the smaller scale later on? You know, that's just a question I have. So I think I've covered it in general. I do have some general concerns about water availability, you know, impact of 5,000 square feet or less, driveway access, the sight lines. I will note the existing home, um, so directly north of that, lots seven in eight, and potentially into par parts of lot nine, that land had been filled, I can't put a timeline on it, but certainly within my lifetime and within my memory. So I would say somewhere in the last 10 to 15 years, maybe maybe 15 to 20 years. But I don't know what impact that has and whether the, the builders of those lots would have knowledge of that or not. But I believe that was brought, clay was brought in to raise that land and level it out so that it could become a meadow, which was in the description that I read. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm, my name's David Hamilton. I'm current homeowner to 40 Mitchell Hill Road, which about slot number one. Um, apparently my issues were the water table, um, drilling so many wells close together. I know the well that I have is a buried well, which isn't very deep, so once you start drilling all these wells that are probably be deeper than mine. I'm probably going to have some problems with my water. Um, my house was built in the 50s, so I believe I do have a ceramic sewer pipe to my septic, which is probably about 30 feet from the property line. Um, I don't know if there's going to be ma any major disturbances with blasting or any ledge issues or anything like that. Um, the other concern would be all the mailboxes currently are on the right side of the road. Um, I don't know if they're going to do that. And also the numbering of the houses are kind of screwed up at the moment. So if you stop jamming seven houses in a quarter mile, I mean, it's going to, I mean, I get the neighbor's mail all the time. So I just want to make sure that something like that would be addressed. And just the water table would be a major concern too. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Sarah May. I live at 57 Mitchell Hill Road, which is directly across from, I believe, lots 7, 8, and 9. Um, we've lived on Mitchell Hill Road for over 30 years, and one of the things that attracted us to that area of Scarborough was the rural nature of it and homes that weren't right on top of each other, that there was plenty of space around each home. Um, giving a sense of privacy and quiet, which we really appreciate. So my big concern about this development is it feels very out of scale with the rest of the neighborhood. So many homes compressed into so few lots. Um, I, I think it's a great idea and it could be a good development somewhere else, but it just doesn't seem to fit with the nature and the character of the road that we love and have lived for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ken Simons, 7 Fingler Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
My, um, my lot is the one on Fingler, which is right at the apex of where you see the extension of lot six land is. Um, and I don't want to repeat what's already been said, but I do want to echo the issues concerning the consolidation, the compression of these lots into a larger area, and it does not conform with the nature of the, the surrounding areas. Um, I do appreciate the open space concept. My concern there is future use of that. Um, there is an existing trail system that extends through that area. Um, I use it all the time. And I'm wondering if there's any um, requirement for them to uh, preserve that, not necessarily maintain it, but preserve those trails that are currently there and existing and are used um, by a number of people for activities, snowshoeing, skiing, uh, snowmobiling, etc. cetera. Um, and lastly, I just want to echo um, Mr. Fangler Sr.'s comments about the Little River, that stream in the, the lower left corner that does um, travel right underneath my driveway, and I can assure you that it flows all year round. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Susan, to go first. Hello. <laughs> Getting late for the old lady. Um, That's why I'm letting you go first. <laughs> I think that this is, as, as, it, as the folks who spoke have said, and it's, it's an example of why it's important that people come to these meetings, because you look at a piece of paper and you don't know. You know all you know is little lines on a piece of paper. So when people come in and say things like, we got a problem with um, the water table. You know, water table issues, really. I think that um, the impact on the aquifer is something that if we can, as a town, take a look at, I mean, we, we're concerned about healthy aquifers. We do all kinds of things to protect <coughs> aquifers. So I would like to recommend that staff make a real effort to work with the applicant to find out just what is happening to the aquifer up there and what will the impact of these new nine lots have on that. Um, I'm con I find it interesting that the, the um, lots need to have turnaround room because we really don't want anybody. I live on Black Point Road. You don't back out on the Black Point Road. You also don't back out onto Mitchell Hill Road. So there needs, you know, I mean, that seems to me to be sort of a duh factor. Um, the trail system, um, I know, I, you can't judge at this time of the night whether or not what I'm saying makes sense. The trail system, we preserve versus maintain, you know, two very different words. Um, it, it will be preserved because it won't be allowed to be developed, but there will, the, the applicant is not required to maintain it. But I think it's something that the Neighborhood Association, because there will be one, can be approached and talk about how, how can that happen. Um, and then there's the thing that we can't probably do anything about, but I want the, I want the um, people who are here to understand that I fully understand the frustration of wanting to live in the country and then have this happen. When I was a kid, I made snow angels in the middle of Black Point Road. No joke. Mm -hmm. How do you think I feel now? It's a little discouraging. And this is discouraging, but it's like you take from one hand and you take from the other hand and we want to preserve wetlands and this is how we do it by giving people a bonus, a density bonus type thing. And I don't have an easy answer to that. I, I just want you to know that I really feel badly that that is an offshoot of something that we tried to do to, to benefit the town. And um, it probably did benefit the town, but it's not going to benefit the people who are closest to it if they, if they move there in order for it to be quiet and open. Um, I'm very concerned about, um, oh, the question. I'm not, ask, I'm not looking for an answer, but a question. Um, why do we have sh shared driveway on number six? <coughs> I don't understand why do we have a shared driveway there. I think it was a function of the way that the lots sort of angle the, the existing driveway does cross the corner of lot five, so we said, well, rather than 
build another driveway five feet away from that one, we'll use the same entrance and then branch off once we get into oh, the lot. Okay. 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 Trying to bring it right in. And then I'm very concerned that we do, if this actually goes ahead, that um, the 25-foot setback to the no disturbed area, how you delineate that is something that we struggle with all the time here on the board. You know, I mean, people are going to walk back there, especially since these are individual homes built by individual builders. Is there going to be an association? If there isn't going to be an association, what do we do about delineating? You know, if you have an association and one person goes out and starts to cut down trees, other people who are members of the association notice that and it gets taken care of. There, there will be a homeowners association. There will be a homeowners yes. association? Yes. Okay, make sure that's in the, in the notes. Um, so I have mixed, I have mixed feelings. Um, as I've been known to say many times, so why not say it again? All the good stuff is gone. All the easy stuff is gone. We are now left with very complicated, complex pieces of, of property. And this is a classic example of getting caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. I think it's um, wonderful that we're saving this property, but I really don't like this row of houses on Mitchell Hill Road. So thank you very much. Thank you. Roger? <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> This is kind. This is kind of interesting. Uh, a lack of water because almost everything else around Scarborough has too much water. <laughs> um, were, were you aware of the the problems with the neighboring wells? No, none whatsoever. As I said, there's an existing house on this property which will inquire through my applicant, uh, through my client. Um, <coughs> are there any issues with that well and with the uh, with the system there? But we, we're not aware of. Of any any problems? Have, um, have is staff aware of any problems up there? No, until, until this evening. Huh? No, no, until, until this evening. evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So we have a potential desert out there, right? What's that? We have a potential desert out there. Um, was there was there any consideration um, in fewer house lots <clears throat> than what you have right there? Um, well, the density supports nine, so <clears throat> the conventional plan on the bottom uh, is how this site could be developed with 80,000 square foot lots. This here is the whole purpose or one of the main purposes of conservation subdivision is the preservation. Now that area in green, 19 and a half acres, it's not all wetland. There's a, there's a lot of upland there, darker green is wetland. So. Uh, the density would support nine and a half. The last concept we came in with, we thought ten lots could be supported. And once we did all of our studies, uh, it came down to nine. So the eight new lots would want to be house. But I understand the density and everything you're trying to uh, accomplish. Yep. But instead of nine lots, could you do eight lots? I just, just, I, to, just yeah. to try and put it in more of the character of that whole area. I have to consult with my client. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take that, uh, that down as a note. I, I guess I don't have anything else. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll kind of echo Susan's sentiments here. Um, now, I live in this area of Scarborough because of the rural character of it all. And, uh, you know, sitting on the planning board, you kind of get to see a lot of things and learn a lot of things. And one of those things is that if you don't have a provision that allows you to do this type of development, then you do risk losing an entire swath of land to develop. And it is that trade-off. And it's a, it's a tough balance, and it's tough to sit here and see that. Um, so I, I certainly feel for all the people that have been speaking here this evening. And, uh, you know, as far as what I'm looking at, though, from an ordinance standpoint, what we're supposed to be doing here tonight, I only have one question, and just more of a curiosity. The you know, line of open space behind lots five to one, one to five, why is there just a, it seems like it's just a, what was the reasoning behind that 15, that is, I'm going to assume 15 foot? I believe that's a 25 foot strip. I, I think the ordinance says all lots must abut open space. And, and we wanted to put a bigger piece of land with uh, the existing house, so I put a open space uh, uh, strip, if you will, around that to, to make it contiguous. I see. And the current owner of lot six is staying? 
I, I don't know that the answer. Okay. Yeah. It just, uh, let's see more kind of a, I, I see you've, you've complied with the, um, the letter of the ordinance, right. creating that connection to open space. I'm just wondering if there would mm -hmm. be a more practical way to make no, that viable. Maybe, maybe it creates a trail, you know, they could, they could develop a, a trail through that strip. Okay. Um, outside of that, I don't have a whole lot to add to what I'm seeing here. Um, I would be curious to see what's going on with the, the water tables there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's about it for right now. Thank Thanks, Nick. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Yeah, I'm looking at lot six with 133,000 square feet and wondering if that can be um, I don't re reimagined, I guess, or, or take another look at that as a possibility for making that actually a separate lot that in back um, with a longer driveway access to it and giving then lots one, two, three, and four at least a little more space so that there's just less of a lineup. And, and I don't know if it's I don't know if it's possible. But that's buildable land. It's part of a lot Correct. currently. Um, the addition of that might eliminate that kind of almost deadly row of houses, one right after the other, only 100 feet in between them. Mm -hmm. And it might provide a possibility to still have nine lots if that's something that's necessary for the business plan of, of the owner, if that's that that's what the owner needs to have. I can address that. Sure. Um, that that becomes that becomes a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm concerned about the the problem with water out there, and if other wells are going dry in the area, um, I think it serves nobody uh, any good to build a bunch of houses that all of a sudden have to build second wells. Exactly. Uh, so I do think you need to take a, a much closer look at the, the water out there. Uh, and alternatively to rejiggering Lot 6, uh, again, I think you should take a look at the, the shared driveways. So again, that there's um, at least a longer space in between, in between these houses. Uh, that would allow it to seem a a little more in keeping with the rural nature. We'll consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it meets it meets the criteria for a conservation subdivision. Um, I understand the public's feeling. I would feel the same way probably if I lived across the street. Um, like Susan said, I don't know what to do about that. Um, it's, it's not in the aquifer overlay zone, right? This is not in this is not an aquifer overlay zone. This is just no. A, yeah. I believe we looked at that issue and it is not. Um, yeah, if there, I, I don't know if I don't know if it's beyond the board to require some sort of study to make to, to try to determine what a water table is out there. I don't even know if that's possible but um, we're going to review the existing well which we have on on lot six so we can see what the conditions are and the depth and so yeah so I can come back with that data so uh, I'll just note that one of the standards that there is a demonstration of adequacy of um, potable water um, okay. so you know what that looks like that we'll have to sure. talk about that I think that's obviously an issue that's staff and the uh, applicants engineer will need can sort of work through okay Provide, at least sure. provide the information that the board can then make your determination from. Right. Okay. I mean, technically it's fine, and uh, I don't really see a lot of issues. Um, the 30,000 square foot lot is going to be open space. Um, I can't see anything wrong with it. Thank you. Um, so just, I, I want to just pick up briefly on this, this uh, sort of notion of rural character, and I just echo what a couple of my colleagues have said, that it is, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough dilemma. Um, the reality is that um, there, as the applicant pointed out, you know, there's, there's a lot of buildable land there regardless. 
that's, that could be built out just as of right. Um, and I think we've all been there at one point or another. Um, you know, um, you can, it's all a matter of public record and you can see how everything is owned and what's buildable and who owns it. And um, that doesn't make it any easier when someone moves in and decides to, to exercise their, their property rights. But um, that is the reality. And as Ms. Oglis pointed out, you know, we, on top of that, we have this conservation subdivision, which has some trade-offs, which I think overall is for the greater good. Um, and we thread the needle on that. Um, it's a burden on all of us involved, but I think overall it's worked pretty well. Um, so given that, um, you know, I think in terms of the big picture, um, uh, I don't see any major concerns. I, I Well, aside from the potential issue of uh, water table, which clearly needs to be explored, um, uh, we've already got driveway turnarounds sort of built into the to the to the lot plans um, the devil may be in the details on those as, as with many things um, I guess in terms of, of process here Jay if I can turn to you um, it seemed to me that there was and maybe I didn't follow this correctly that the applicant didn't necessarily agree that they were disturbing more than an acre <coughs> Is that something that needs to be explored further with staff? Um, and I think I'm talking about it right now, um, at the very least, as kind of a threshold question of whether we're in a position to consider preliminary subdivision approval, sure. or whether the you know the, the aquifer question plays into that or not at this stage. Yeah. So, so yeah, the the acre of disturbance area was a question that staff posed to the applicant um, upon receiving their initial submission. Uh, board members may note that this there was a submission that we found incomplete and sort of as part of that due diligence that was one of the questions we had asked so in their most recent submission the narrative that we received and that we reviewed and board has reviewed said that they wouldn't be disturbing an acre um, subsequent to staff comments going out it was either Thursday Wednesday Thursday or Friday I think it was Jamel had a follow-up conversation uh, maybe it was Mr. Thompson or someone else from his office that Might have been said the applicant. Yeah. You know, could have been the applicant. Yeah. Either way, someone yeah. from the team uh, <laughs> suggesting that yes, we will ultimately disturb more than an acre. And as I sort of noted at the outset, that then sets forth the requirement for um, a higher level of stormwater review um, to ensure that we're meeting Chapter 500 um, standards, sort of DEP standards. Um, and frankly, we've seen applications similar to this where, you know, it's, you know, because it's a linear project, maybe that's just uh, the application of um, uh, undisturbed buffer areas. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see a big pond or sort of what we might typically see in a parking lot type situation. You know, but again, those are sort of details to be vetted. Um, so I do think that is a, sort of a threshold question to meeting sort of does the app, has the applicant sort of met the stormwater question? Uh, you know, we, we don't have the answer to that at this point. Can they probably get there? It seems like there's a, a viable solution out there, but we don't know the answer to that. Um, and then I guess the question to the board would be, are you satisfied that there is adequate capacity um, in terms of uh, uh, water um, service out here? Um, and so I think those would really be the two threshold questions for the board to consider okay. um, in terms of any potential preliminary action tonight. Okay. Uh, given that, and I am trying to be mindful of the time because I know we've got one more item to get to tonight and we're nearing our cutoff point and I want to be sensitive to that without giving short shrift to the current applicant. Um, given that, it seems to me, and I'm just looking for head nods that that there, did, there is a question about adequacy of, of water. Um, and then the broader question of uh, the disturbed area. So I, given that, and the, the water availability seems to me the, to be the, the most, you know, the brightest line, um, it seems to me that there's some more work to be done here before we take any formal action. I didn't realize we were thinking about formal action. Well, it would just be a preliminary subdivision approval. No. I say just, but that would be a yeah. that I would be an actual no. motion. I, just further, I do have a little bit of concern about the 
one acre worth of disturbance spread over nine lots. But I think I think that's pushing a reasonable limit, especially if you're talking turnarounds and driveways. The square footage you'll accumulate in driveways, long house. I, I mean, as I believe one of the people got a spoke and mentioned it. It's close. Uh, no. If staff finds it acceptable that it's a plan note and they're going to keep track of every square foot that's, uh, that's touched out there, well, I guess that's fine. I mean, but I'm, I'm not 100% comfortable with the plan. I, I tend, I'm inclined to agree with that as well. Um, it seems like there's general agreement. So um, that will be to be continued. Uh, I do want to add, I personally, and I didn't hear anyone else speak to this specifically. I personally would like to see a vernal pool assessment done in the spring, as long as, particularly since there's other exploration that needs to be done anyway. Um, and uh, obviously, we've got some other plan cleanup to do to make sure that we show the stream and so forth. So, um, beyond that, uh, does the applicant need anything else from us at this point? No, I just, on the stormwater thing, it's a little unique in the sense we're going to be selling eight lots and we don't know what they're going to build so to try to come forward with a stormwater uh, solution well we, Sammy, don't what, and we don't know if there's going to be a problem that it sort of cuts both ways because right. it, it's a it's an issue it's an issue for us in the same time that we don't know what's going to be built so to right. be so close mm -hmm. to that uh threshold um it seems to me it has to be tied to a building permit and a site design no. for each lot no. So it can be managed by, by somebody. In this case, code enforcement and uh, engineering department. Uh, so, so uh, and maybe Angela, I don't know if you want to chime in, but uh, I mean, the, to to the applicant's um, sort of point on that, the board has recently done conditions that sort of require s particular site grading um, as part of an, uh, a planning. Uh, building permit application, but I don't know, Angela, if you want to sort of touch on what those expectations might be, or I, I, I don't know if you I, want well, that sort of level of discussion at this point. But. I, I think it's more about um, how close they I mean, can you actually fit a typical house, a typical driveway, a typical lawn, septic, well, and we've run into that in the past, um, and also that they have more areas that could clear, like their lawn gets bigger than what they would anticipate. If if they're that close, you know it's probably going to get pushed beyond that. So I guess that is. Well, I, and I guess that the, the uh, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, you know, again, based on the conversation that Jamel had earlier in the week, they, they recognize they're going to go over the acre threshold. They've, they've said they've gone back and looked at it and said, yes, we're going over the anchor threshold. So now I think the question is, and that was, I think Mr. Thompson's point is sort of, how do, you, how do you do that as part of a subdivision process? And I think that's where staff is certainly uh, willing to sit down and have those conversations about what that looks like um, in preparing a plan to address that issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any other questions. Right. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. We're going to keep moving. Item number seven, Rosewood Land Development, Inc. requests a subdivision review for Tucker Brook subdivision, Payne Road, map R49, lot two. Jamel. All right. Come on. First stab at it. I know it's late, but I'll uh, try and make this quick. So, as Jay noted before, this is a conservation subdivision. Um, it's the same same rules. So, percent or more of open space and it's intended to protect the town's natural resources and waterways. And we'll note that it's in the R2 zoning district. Um, so, the applicant came in front of the board in November. 2017 for sketch plan um, and it was one of the main points of discussion was um, it's not, the parcel is not served by public sewer um, so the board was charged with um, deciding if it was a reasonable request 
ask the developer to connect to the public sewer line. Um, so the board should be sure to consider this again during this um, formal preliminary plan. I believe that was, the distance was approximately 3,000 feet um, to the public sewer along Payne Road, but maybe the applicant could talk about that a little further in his presentation. Um, other issues are specific lot design and configuration. Uh, the parcel is located in the Beaver Brook watershed, which is listed in the state's threatened stream list, so it's important to consider. And then finally, the open space and future ownership. Um, staff has had initial conversations with the Scarborough Land Trust um, about the project, uh, the open space parcel, and the Land Trust did indicate that they um, were potentially interested in the parcel, so the applicant may want to chat with them about that in the future. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Angela for other issues. Um, I guess I just wanted to highlight the conservation subdivision, obviously, as Jamil said, is about really avoidance of the wetlands. And so where they're showing less than 10,000 square feet of impact of those wetlands, I think really how this is laid out, um, there is potential for further impact. And, and I'll speak to that a little bit, is that the natural topography of this this lot and, and what feeds the wetlands below. And so when you start looking at the alignment of the road and the lots um, that bisect it. And so really, I guess what I'm hoping for is the board look at maybe, is there potential to do like some overall grading of that so that you can still have some of the runoff from those lots that are being created feed the lower um, wetlands. And so really what it comes down to is maybe crossing lot eight driveway, for instance, um, having some of that runoff be able to feed those wetlands below so that you're not impacting them, so you're not maybe drying them up or making it less conducive for natural habitat for those lower portions, specifically, too, because it is, as Jamal mentioned, on the, the threatened list, the Beaverbrook watershed. So preserving those wetlands, I think, is really key, um, specifically in, in this process. And just a Thanks. final staff note, uh, we did have peer review comments from Woodard and Kern, as well as uh, Bill Gray from Traffic Solutions, looking at traffic. Um, and we did receive, and I believe board members also received uh, a couple of public comment letters. Uh, so those were yes, emailed to you, so I just want to... Thank you, we do have those. You would likely mention that at public comment time, but I just yeah. want to mention that as well. So. Thank you all. And I'll hand it over to Mr. Frank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that working? Uh, hopefully, I think so. I think okay. that one is more for, not, for the, not for our benefit, it's more for the AV. Okay, well, good. Yeah. Can anyone hear me all right? That's all I guess. Is. <laughs> I just wanted to take a quick walk over here. Um, and just from a presentation standpoint. Uh, again, we were here last November, as you may recall. Uh, the plans, obviously, we've tightened them up quite a bit since that time period, uh, but the basics are still pretty much the same. We've got Payne Road uh, right here, uh, Regal Pines Drive across the street over here. We have a proposed roadway that's coming in approximately 900 feet, just over 900 feet in length, uh, culminating in the cul-de-sac. Uh, what we're proposing is uh, 14 single-family uh, residential home slots uh, to be serviced by that road. Uh, as you may recall, uh, we did have a lot of discussion regarding sewer at that point in time. It is over 3,000 feet away. I, I have talked to the sanitary district. Again, they have uh, and actually talked to them again this morning. Uh, they have no plans in terms of any future uh, sewer out in this area, certainly not in the foreseeable future. Uh, obviously, the topography, if you will, is away from Payne Road. Uh, so in terms of putting a dry sewer in, would that be manholes with a gravity system of some sort? Uh, that, in this case, would be the exact opposite. We'd be looking at probably E1 systems, uh, tying into a common force main and pumping back up to Payne Road, assuming if any sewer actually went into Payne Road. Uh, so he said, you know, if, if he was, if anything was going to be out there, then probably what he'd ask is for a common force main within the roadway. Uh, no services installed or anything along those lines. Uh, again, with the uh, with the nature of the sewer, I mean, I would just say that you know, if sewer does come by with Payne Road, if we're going to be putting services in for uh, pumps at that point in time, then probably just running that common force main would be probably that would be the time to do it rather than uh, up front. Uh, 
I did want to go through some of the uh, comments, and again, I'll try to be brief here. I certainly appreciate the board uh, staying with us here this evening. Again, the sewer, I think we talked a little bit about uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the layout of the lots. Of course, we had a lot of things working here, which was the wetland impacts, the setbacks associated with the streams and those types of things, and passing soils. As, uh, as most of you will know, is, you know, passing soils in the state of Maine is 9 inches. Uh, it's 15 in, uh, in the town of Scarborough. Uh, so some of the lots have actually, you know, designed, if you will, around what we the proposed septic systems associated with it. Uh, Beaverbrook Watershed, uh, we do appreciate that. Uh, that's why we did have uh, all of the road runoff, if you will, directed towards the pond, a uh, proposed wet pond. Uh, from our standpoint, we think wet ponds uh, provide a, a good level of treatment associated with it. Uh, we have seen some issues in regards to the forebay. Uh, we weren't overly concerned, if you will, from the impacts, if you will, from the sufficient runoff uh, directed towards the wetlands. It's a good-sized wetland, as you can see. Obviously, there's a lot of water coming down through the, uh, the eroded stream, if you will, uh, crossing the road within the culvert. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a high groundwater associated with it. I mean, really, a lot of the water that we're talking about is the stuff that percolates down, hits the clay, and then just kind of migrates, if you will, along that clay lens uh, down to the wetlands. So uh, in terms of surficially, uh, I did discuss this with our wetland uh, scientist, and uh, he wasn't overly concerned in terms of, you know, uh, surface runoff and associated with the, uh, the wetland impacts. Um, uh, we will need uh, a DEP permit, uh, and actually uh, I, I have a meeting arranged for them. Um, the open space, that'd be more than sufficient. Uh, what we'd probably do at that point in time would be to uh, uh, break out the stormwater management pond uh, and make that part of the uh, subdivision uh, separately. And if, uh, obviously if the land trust or anyone would be uh, happy to, uh, to take that land, we'd be more than happy to uh, work with them on that. And uh, my client uh, will, will have that conversation. Uh, in terms of the, the log grading, uh, we'd be more than happy. Again, I, I know the board has had where a prior part of uh, uh, a building permit, we do a lot grading uh, associated with that for each lot uh, as part of that building permit process. Again, obviously, we don't know exactly where the driveways or the size of the home or the location of the home is going to go. Um, as part of that, as you may recall, uh, we also discussed whether, could there be any relaxations of those front setbacks. Um, due to the fact that even though it's not a conservation subdivision, we're still meeting some conservation requirements. Unfortunately, by ordinance, uh, the front setback, it's basically the space and bulk requirement for the B2 zone has to be maintained. Uh, as you may recall, uh, we had shown the 75-foot setback, certainly for the building envelopes uh, from the stream all along the side. Mm -hmm. I had asked if we could maintain a 50-foot uh, no disturb buffer off from that, 75 feet to the building envelope. Uh, 50 feet, no disturb. Uh, you know, Joe and I discussed it a little bit. Well, you can see some of these building envelopes are real good size, so we're not overly concerned with those. So, uh, what we really, you know, be comfortable, or we'd like to ask the board is the 75 foot uh, setback from the stream to the foundation, uh, for five and seven. Uh, with a little relaxation to a 50 foot undisturbed buffer for those two lots, and we maintain the 75 foot is undisturbed on all the other lots. So one, two, three, four, five of the lots would have a 75 foot undisturbed buffer from the stream. Ask for two of the lots, we can maintain a 50 foot undisturbed buffer, about 75 foot setback to the, to the foundation. Uh, obviously, we are meeting the, uh, the stormwater. The intent of this is to meet the, you know, to get uh, the runoff into the pond and to treat it. Uh, we, I did talk to you about the, uh, uh, the setbacks, uh, underground cables, and the transformer. Of course, all those details we'd be more than happy to, uh, to finalize and, and work with that. Um, the street trees, uh, however we want to do that, again, what I typically don't is actually show them on the plan because we don't know exactly where the driveways are going to go, uh, but at least ag agree to what the, uh, the, the minimum number would be and uh, uh, the species that everyone would be co uh, comfortable with. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, sent everything to the water district in association with the layout. Uh, this will be have municipal water in it, will be a, com uh, a roadway with catch basins, a sidewalk on one side, uh, and I think we have a, a, a light pole to propose at the hammerhead. So uh, that's my quick uh, summary, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, we appreciate the board staying with us this evening, and so I'm happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before we turn to the board, we do have the opportunity for public comment. I think you all know the ground rules by now. I do know the ground rules. <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm Marilyn Taylor. I live at 168 Payne Road, so this is my house. Um, 
And there is a creek called Tucker Brook. Or called Tucker Brook Estates. Um, it's badly eroding, partly because there's a culvert that comes right here and cascades water down into the Tucker Creek. Um, it's pretty wet, 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 wet. Um, there is a housing development over here, and I think it's the diversion from their runoff, because they're a little higher than we are, that creates the, the cascade for that culvert. My issues are primarily the same issues you've heard from all except you people um, all night long. It's traffic and water runoff. 14 sewer systems. Um, in that 20 acre parcel that are going downstream and run off from the roads. And um, if, I don't know if clear cutting is planned. It's a very heavily forested area or treed area right now. And if a lot of clear cutting was planned, I think that would exacerbate any runoff issues that there might be, and I think those are my primary concerns. And you also have notes about wildlife, and I didn't know, as an abutter, that you guys came and talked in November. Thank you. Thank you for letting me Thank you, and thanks for hanging in there for us. I'm Ed Bonifant from Six Colonial Drive. We're abutting on the back side. Uh, the lot plan that's up on the screen there is a little bit deceiving because I think most of the lots on Colonial are double lots. Uh, I live on the third house and I'd be about the fifth on that plan. But, uh, I've looked at this property because it's been for sale for quite some time. The uh, original landowner actually approached me for an easement through our property to access it from Colonial Drive because looking at this, this is the only logical point out on the pavement. It happens to be right beyond the crest of the hill. Now it is a 35 mile an hour speed zone, but traffic traffic is undisturbed from Hagus Parkway all the way to the one. And the uh, police department will probably let you know that most of the traffic is flowing 45, 50 miles an hour. It is not uncommon during storms for that section of the road to be blocked off because people come over the crest of the hill and they get an access probably end up in your door yard. <laughs> and it's not uncommon three or four times a winter for that to, that to occur. Um, the entire lower part of this is all wetlands, active stream, all feeding into the marsh, 14 lots. When I was walking it, I was visioning three houses, maybe shoehorning a fourth in there. We're looking at 14. This is extremely, extremely compact. Um, so hopefully we are going to get uh, a good environmental impact study for the water quality uh, of the brook as well as the stream below it and the entire marsh system. Um, I did some uh, internet searching, trying to find this Rosewood Land Development, Inc. The only one I could find was out of Minnesota. Hopefully we're not selling out to a land developer from Minnesota, but I don't know. And uh, that's what I have. Thank you. We're <clears throat> getting down to maybe the last two. I'm Dave Deedy, and I live on 5 Colonial Drive in Scarborough. I'm not a property of butter, but my neighborhood obviously is. Um, a lot of the concerns I have are, are similar to what you've heard tonight from a lot of people. Um, they mentioned before, you know, there was one point in time where I think actually part of Payne Road actually washed out, and they had to block the road and shut it because some of the erosion that came through. Um, I did, the highway department can confirm that a little bit more, but. I just know, generally speaking, looking at the, the wetlands and some of the wetlands delineation that I saw up there, it was so finely defined and tuned. It, you know, I, I've never seen it stripped and that perfect <laughs> before. So 
just a little bit better assessment of, of what actually is wetlands out there. I've walked that land plenty of times. You know, they're very likely to be vernal pools out there. Um, it, it's constantly wet. I know that Earth Tech did a study of the whole Haggis Parkway development area back in, you know, when they were getting ready to, to build <coughs> Haggis Parkway. And Skyro Sanitary District did have a development plan to sewer the area. In particular, they were concerned with the Heritage Acres development and the septic systems. I know you talked about this already, I think, in your last meeting. Um, unfortunately, until I got this letter in the mail, I, I do appreciate the planning board for sending these out. I had no idea what was going on out there. Um, so I do thank you for, for sending these letters out, bringing this to our attention. But that study showed the entire area of the Haggis uh, Parkway development area, the Heritage Acres development. This contiguous land has got the same soil type, same soil nature. The high groundwater table in that area is a concern. I'm fortunate where I'm across the street, I've got a good sub-basement drainage system, but I know there's water in some of those basements from time to time. I think the clear cutting, you know, looking at the setbacks of the property, I think it's gonna cause more problems with the groundwater table in the area potentially more flooding for some of my neighbors. Um, so I just wanted to express my concern. It looks like they're trying to cram an awful lot of lots to maximize as much you know, value of the property as they can. I can certainly understand that, but if you could reassess your, your layouts and your, I know you're looking for more variance for the frontage, but you only got a 15 foot buffer in the back of the houses. Yeah, I don't know, there's, there's, there's ways you could redo your layout and maybe put a few less houses in give a little bit more privacy and buffers. And certainly, you know, I know this all this water flows down and flows under Flaherty's farm and out into the marsh. You know, there's a critical nature. A lot of people that, you know, make a living with clamming and other stuff in town. That's what this town was, was built on. I think there'll be a significant issue potentially with people <coughs> putting Kevlon on all their lawns and everything else. So if you can, you know, I think these line, you know, in order to get the septic systems the worst, I think you're going to have to clear cut and build these big leach fields, and then that's going to be a nice big grassy area that people are going to put Kevlon down. <coughs> you know, Skyro, you have to have the greenest lawn in town, so you know, just a concern for environmental impacts as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> My name is uh, Roba Bonifant, and um, I live on 6 Colonial Drive. And um, I just wanted to reiterate everything that these other people said. I know you said don't repeat, but I feel like I, we can't say it enough, but the property that this property that they want to build on is, is beautiful. We've lived there for 30 years, and it is like nature, and I know you've already said that we shouldn't get used to that. Um, but it is a uh, home of many animals. I, I um, cross country ski and snowshoe out there. There's deer, wild turkey, bunny rabbits, uh, ducks. There's all kinds of wildlife, and I just worry about the impact that um, building 14 homes would have on um, the watershed and the um, you know, the streams and the, and the water um, down below it. So um, I hope you take that into consideration. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, just for the record, Jay alluded to it, we had a couple pieces of written correspondence as well. We had a letter from Penelope Taylor and another letter from Jacob Kramer. And those were distributed to all members and are entered into the record as well. So thank you for all of that. Um, so we will turn to the board now. And uh, Rick? Sure. Hey, um, what zone is this? What zone are we in? R2. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. It's really, really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
probably should let Robin go first so she could ask about these wetlands. This this um, little piece of wetland like underneath the road there. Are you? Um, yeah. Yes. What are we doing with that? We're proposing to fill that. Okay, so you're just going to fill that and dig it out somewhere. That's the transfer. that's the nine thousand square feet of impact we're talking about. Okay. Um, And then with the 50-foot setbacks from the stream that you're looking for on um, on low on five lot five and seven instead of the 75, that right. still meets all the DEP requirements. We would have, we need a permit by rule associated. Just a permit. By yes. Rule. Okay. We'd maintain a 75-foot setback to the to the to the building envelope itself. So the the, the building would be 75 feet back. Uh, if we remove the trees and put lawn within that 25 foot they would consider the <coughs> soil disturbance so we would need a permit by rule uh, for that disturbance within that 25 feet right. okay and then uh, okay and then um, and this is a 35 mile an hour zone right there so how much yeah we did um, um, we did um, we did measure this the site distance yeah, it was part of the report uh, from the driveway. We had 950 feet looking to the left yeah. and 550, 550 feet looking to the right. <coughs> um, so, you know, I appreciate that they're, they're going faster there, um, probably than the 35 miles per hour. I've certainly ridden that road enough to know that right. you know, the speed is probably going quicker than that. What I would say is, you know, just based upon those sight distances, is there's more right. than adequate sight distance from that driveway. Yeah. All right. Site distances, you get 9,000 feet. Um, yeah, I think I like Robin talking, but as long as you have the from the rule, I don't think. Yeah, okay. I'm all right. Thank I don't you. see anything wrong with it. Okay. Rachel? I, I have a strange question. Um, could uh, could you talk to me about the bunny rabbits there? <laughs> oh, I see wild rabbits. You have to go up. Yeah, you need to go back up. So. <laughs> I've seen wild rabbits there once in a while, not in the recent future. I mean, the recent, not recently, but in the past. Is is the land heavily forested or is it more scrub? It's it's heavily forested. We get down to the um, to water, the the marsh. It's more open, but there's a lot of scrub brush in there. All right, there there is a, a provision for the uh, preservation of, of habitat for the eastern jackrabbit, uh, the cotton eastern cottontails. Yeah. I have uh, twelve of them there. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, it, I, it doesn't. It, it doesn't immediately address the way the property is laid out, but it does raise the the question of the use of that open space uh, as a preservation area for the eastern cottontail. Um, that would really allow that space not just to be open, but um, to preserve a one of the uh, natural habitats that's left in in Scarborough. Uh, I know when Pleasant Hill Benjamin Farms was being looked at, there was a question about the um, about the preservation there, whether the habitat was suitable, and it seems to me that at some point there's actually funding available for that. Uh, I would hate to see uh, I would like to see something done with that open space, let's say, that um, really does preserve what we have in terms of, of the wildlife. I, I suspect that uh, this development is will be going through um, with some details worked out, but uh, I would also like to see um, perhaps more of a plan around the open space. Let's save the bunny rabbits. Thank you. That was me. Okay. Um, so, Sean, have you checked the beginning with habitat maps and other Endangered Species Act? Uh, that's a good question. I and I, you know, I, okay. I, I can't say I know. I personally okay. have not, but I, okay. I will certainly have to check my records. Super. Well. Let's follow up on that. Um, and the next question is for staff. Um, 
So I'm looking at the subdivision. I'm looking at the subdivision review, Chapter 406, Section 4K, that says whenever suited, situated um, in whole or in part within 250 feet of any pond, lake, stream, river, wetland, or tidal waters, the proposed subdivision will not adversely affect the quality of such body of water or wetland. So, do the conservation subdivision? Um, Sort sort of allow that to be relaxed from 250 to the 75. Is that where that comes from? The setback 250 feet. Well, I think the 250 feet is we have a 250 foot setback from from identified from the, the higher order streams. I guess I'm not sure what the quite the right terminology is. So. Um, it says, I guess I don't have the language right in front of me. So no, it says 250 yeah. feet of any pond, lake, stream, river, wetland, or tidal waters. Yeah. Whenever situated within that, the proposed subdivision will not adversely affect the quality of such body of water or wetland or unreasonably affect the shoreline of such body of water or wetland. And um, I was just wondering, uh, what I'm getting at here, Sean, is, is if we have 250 feet and to ask us to relax it from 75 to 50 or more, I think is, to me, is out of the question. Kind of thing, but so. my two, and, and I've been doing a few subdivisions in Scarborough in the past, but I, when I was reading, when everyone was going with 250, that, that to me was always getting back to the shoreland zoning issue. In terms yeah, of, no, I'm with you. I am you know, totally like, with you. Like a wetland being at that point, a freshwater right. wetland, 10 acres and that type of Agreed, thing. Agreed, but I think we're pushing it here. I think we're pushing it here as far as the number of, of, of uh, parcels is concerned kind of a thing. So um, just understand that the, it's late. I'm being very direct. <laughs> and probably not very diplomatic, and that the relax and Rob, that's relaxation. Fine. Again, I've got, I've got to know where we're yep. coming from. Yep. I, I would just say, as again, I think I'd like to go back. If you do net residential here, we're allowed to do 24. I mean, right. just by net residential. So I don't want people to think that you know we're trying to clam every last one into this this development that we can possibly get sure. into. Sure. Talk to me about the date of your the wetland study. Uh, it I was originally it. done in 2011, uh, okay. but Gary Fulton from my office went yep. back out there again last fall. And I think you actually had, uh, I forget, Jim Logan as well, was doing uh, the soils and, and okay. did some additional wetland work So as well. we just need to understand that 2016 we were in drought conditions, and I've said it a million times, probably half a million times to you, um, just that the drought conditions um, that we've experienced in 2016 that lingered into 2017 do not provide a good baseline for establishing where the delineation of the, the, the edge of the, the, the wetlands are, Sean. And so, um, so we are. Uh, I'm going to err on the side of caution and a lot of things and setbacks and things like that because maybe the, the the wetland, the edge of the wetland that was observed in 2017 is actually not quite the edge of the setback that it would be normally in in under normal conditions. And again, and I would appreciate that, but again, I want to look at this side. As you can see, it's. It's got some good topography to it. It does, but it also has, you know, we haven't checked the beginning with habitat maps, so it's got some good, it could potentially have some significant and critical habitat, too. Um, and I don't want to belabor the points, but I, I also want to understand when the timeline for the build-out will be. Because if this is, we are just going to get site plan approval and put this in a drawer so that we can build it at some point when there's not <laughs> such a building demand, then I want us to re-examine in like say say this plan gets subdivision approval and it sits in a drawer for five years and in five years Scarborough Sanitary District decides wow we've had so much development down Payne Road we should reopen whether or not we're going to extend that 3,000 feet down to to this subdivision area here um, so I guess I'm leaning toward if the build out isn't going to be imminent then we might want to have some type of condition of, of approval that says if it's over, you know, before it moves forward, we should check with the Scarborough Sanitary District. Just putting it out there. The last, one of the last things I want to uh, talk about is this 14 septic systems. One of the last times you were here, I asked, is there any way we could do some type of coordinated or group uh, sewer system like they do it on ponds and camps and things like that, Sean? Was that explored at all with the applicant? The developer, you mean the common system. Yes, I didn't remember that conversation. To be oh, honest with you, no. but I don't think I don't think your ordinance allows it. Does it, Jay? Does it not? A allow common it? septic system. I don't think is allowed for a residential subdivision. 
Uh, you know, I'm not certain of that. I'd have to have a conversation with our zoning administrator. Who that's my recollection. Right? So, okay. But again, I'd be honest yep. with you, I don't remember that conversation yep. nope, in terms of a fine. common system. Um, I know there was some, please go see the sanitary district and make sure that yeah. you know, I did do that. But. I think we gotta, we got to have something here because when I looked at the groundwater impact analysis, I um, it study, it looks like they're, they're, thanks for including all the test bits. That was good information. We got 10, 20, 32. So we got uh, 32 that are sort of in the C range and six test pits that were in the D range and D is unsuitable and C is uh, what's generally C is that is that the um, um, hydric soils C no, no no I think it's the other way around is so, it yes. okay um, I just uh, I'm wondering if maybe um, because this is such a complex site, if maybe a peer review of the groundwater impact study and analysis might be appropriate, because I was concerned where they got the K, their conductivity value, based on the deer field and the wall pole soils that were there. I, I don't know about using a K value of four feet per day for, for those soils. So I, I would just uh, question that. So. Oof, I'm tired. I can appreciate I'm so that. Sorry. Again, I know. No, Again, no, no, you I'm, don't have to apologize. I'm we really sorry for the directness, that. but I wanted to put it all out there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGee. Okay, so I'm going to start with Angela. Um, can you go over what you were, what you were saying about the, the what was when well, you started? Think, actually, this is a good picture um, because I think it's really lots. Um, I'm going to say 9 through 14, that upper portion. You can see the contour lines all heading towards really the in the center of the site. That's where the wetlands begin there, the larger piece. And then it obviously does like a sort of a ditch line that connects it and feeds into the lower portion of the wetland. So basically, that's bisecting everything. So from... <laughs> Basically, from that section up, all that water is no longer going to the wetlands below. And I understand what he's, uh, Sean was saying about um, down below the wetlands where they converge is going to continue to get water because it crosses Cane Road. But there's also the finger that goes up that doesn't come from Cane Road that will no longer have water going to it. And so to say that that's not impacted, I think there's potential it would be. So in order, so what I'm saying is less than 10,000 square feet might not be the true case. That when you stop having water feeding to that, it might be more like 20,000. So did you say you had a solution as well? Yes, well what I was thinking is that um, we're already talking about doing individual lot plans, which we do a lot of times um, from this board as a condition that as they come in for building permit, um, I work with contractors to, to develop a lot by lot kind of grading plan. I think in this case, if you um, you took some of the area of these lots, and I'm talking like the back portion of the, the back lawns, basically, and you created like a common swale that runs along um, the upper portion, or like I said, the back of those lots, and they all join and then can cross lot eight's driveway it would give an opportunity to feed that. You know what I'm saying? So, but you can't do it on a lot by light basis because I'm gonna, I could have lot 11 come in and then 14 and then nine and then they wouldn't be able to have that common swale that connects them. You know what I'm saying? It needs to be a, a master kind of plan of the grading in that respect. Does the applicant have any general thoughts on a proposal such as that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, and I, and maybe I didn't quite understand what Angela was coming about. I think you know, we're talking a swale along, you know, I, I'm assuming we're talking like a gentle grass swale that would kind of just pick everything up and direct it down there so they could still be kind of used. But yeah, we'd be more than happy to do that. I actually did ask if I could come see you, so I'll sit down with Angela. We'll work something out. Okay. Well, that's resolved. Uh, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure from the name of this, I've got a good idea of what it is, but I'd like a little bit more detail on what a common force main is. What is it? It's, it would be like if if it wasn't a force main, like the, the sewer out in the road. Go real basic with me. I don't work in sewers. Right, so, so 
Are we talking a pipe this big in the ground? No, it's going to be about two inches. See, now we're getting some, <laughs> okay. okay, so you've got a two-inch pipe in the ground that you're going to run the entire length of the road? Correct. Okay. All right, and then each one of these these lots would have its own individual pump. It's a little fiberglass thing that you, you know, so your, your sewer pipe out of your house would yeah. come gravity to a little pump station. Okay, that pump station would pump to a smaller force main. That smaller force main would come from your yard and tie into the common force main within the road. Okay. And the sanitary district's telling you to put those in? He said if, he, if there was anything, he said if, if, if he wanted anything, then that's all he would want to be done out there is to put that common force main down the road. I personally, if the sewer comes out there and we need to do services to each one of these lots and each one of these lots is going to have, then, you know, at that point, putting a, a, a common force main down the shoulder of a road or, you know, in a ditch line or something along those lines seems to be a, the, one of the simplest parts of the whole thing. So. But that's done post-build out. Correct. Which would be the whole thing too, right? The post build would be the pumps, the services, the every all the appurtenances that go with it, the clean outs. So if you sold all those lots and build them out, and then ten years later you expect the sanitary district to knock on your door, and you're going to go back and put it in? No, we won't be putting it. Absolutely not. You saw the eight corners when they did that whole sewer system out through there, and they put a sewer down and through there. And if your septic was working fine, if not, then here's your here's your fee to put it back so in. Who puts that in later? Twenty years from now? Ten years from now? If the sewer gets out there from the sanitary district and there's a service to happen in through there, then it's going to be the, the lot owners. Okay, and I think that goes back to my original concern, which is convincing 14 people to chip in for a system like that is never going to happen. So, oh. I mean, that's... I don't want to jump in except <laughs> um, when the sewer came down through Black Point Road, the, the uh, company... Um, we're all tired. The sewer district paid to have it go down by my house, but I had to pay to connect. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I don't see any difference between that and what we're talking about here. Right. If the sewer did come down, you know, the sewer district would bring the water, would bring the main to the, down the road, if it was a pub, if it's a public road, if it's going to be, a, you know, town on the road, it would be just gonna... So the sewer district, the sanitary district would actually run it down that road? The Tucker Brook Road, or whatever. We're gonna, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would run it right down there. They don't just drive, drive it by Payne Road and then ask all those owners to connect out to Payne, do they? I can't answer that. I, it would you know. be a matter of what their project okay. scope was. Right. Right. That's what it, I mean, if I want a better understanding. If they're going the through the whole process of running it down Payne Road, I mean, the point of that process would be to pick up all the houses and residences that are off. Correct. The side roads from Payne Road, Payne Road, and the side road. So okay. my anticipation. Would be yeah. That's that would be the whole point of it at that point in time. Okay. Now, I, I guess I, I just wanted to chime in. We just did that down Broad Turn Road though, and some of those smaller cul-de-sac ones we did not connect. They were not connected in um, okay. for that reason. It's their septics were working, and there was no reason. No to interest. Win. There was additional cost for the sewer district, which they would not incur. Wasn't there also a case with distance from the, the line? The lateral. The line we're we keeping you up. So. Right. I don't think we're going to get the system designed today. All right, so uh, the 50 foot reduction, I'm not in favor of that um, on those two lots. Uh, wetlands, you know, back in the good old days, see, I've been kicking around this board for a little while. There was a time where we wouldn't let you have any wetlands on any private property. And I'm sure you put a couple of subdivisions through here and we made you move those lot lines around. I'm just going to point that out. So I don't favor the 50-foot reduction on your buffers on those two lots. Um, and I have a question from staff. Do we want a peer review on wetland delineation and vernal pools? I would be okay with a peer review on this, considering some of the points that Robin's brought up uh, regarding maybe some of the data that they have on these delineations might be from a drier season. Uh, you know, I'd like to see, I guess would be a bad thing. And that is it for my notes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything, Roger? The, the, only, uh, the only comment I would have is um, on Tucker Brook itself and the concern of um, the abutters and the erosion, is that something the town has, you know, with the ditching along Payne Road, would, it, would that have any effect on that? It sounds to me like maybe the water's running down Payne Road. It's getting diverted. 
into that. Into no, that. I think it's more the water coming through the culvert crossing piece. Oh, is that what it is? And I think it's actually now it's 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 higher than the the, the stream bed. Yeah. So it's you know it's definitely eroding. Okay. So if you're asking, eventually, yeah, it would be a, it's in the town right away that culvert. So it would be the town's responsibility for replacement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. <laughs> Thanks. Is this going to have a homeowners association? Yes, because we have the pond to take care of. Okay, that's yeah, the pond to take care of. If we have the homeowners association, I would like to have a note that um, it has. We have to seriously consider the, the suggestion to not chemi to use no chemicals on the lawns of something that's going to be right flat smack in the middle of a wetland. Um, no clear cutting. And it's different, you know, take down trees to build a house, but you know, no clear cutting. Um, what was the other one? There's another one. There's one, two, three, no clear cutting. Um, oh, um, did we check the vernal pools? Uh, we did. Actually, Jim Logan made a okay. uh, review of that. And then you didn't find any? He did not. Okay. Um, I really like the idea of getting the, um, let's look for bunnies. And this is a brilliant idea. And um, I mean, the density impacts on the marsh. Um, that's my thing. I mean, I'm, when I'm not talking about white pines, I'm talking about the marsh. And um, anything that we can do to, to mitigate the impact on this wetland, I mean, I can't, we can't keep you from doing this, but anything that we can do, um, by the way, you never get used to this. Somebody said you get used to it after a while. No, you never get used to the loss of of really attractive land where there's nice things going on. <laughs> you never get used to it. Um, and I'm also concerned about the speed on, um, on Payne Road presently and what might be able to be done if we're going to put all these houses sitting on Payne Road. Here. So I guess that's enough for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I will just pick up on the, the question on peer review of wetlands delineation. and I agree that that's something that should be done under the circumstances. I also agree with the habitat assessment, whatever whatever form that takes. We'll leave the staff to coordinate if you're comfortable with that. Um, and I agree with what Ms. Zoglis said about Payne Road, and we come up against this periodically where we all know that every time I crest that hill, I check my speed and I I'm going 15 miles an hour over the, over the limit. I have to be conscious about slowing down. Um, so, I'll, you know, if it meets the sight distance, then so be it. But I, you know, if that's something to sort of put out there. We've, we've talked earlier tonight about things the town has done and maybe could do uh, further on Black Point Road where there's a particularly dangerous set of circumstances. So uh, that may be maybe something appropriate to explore as that stretch gets more developed. Um, and despite the town's and DOT's best efforts, people still use Pin <coughs> Road uh, to get to and from exit 42 and Cabela's. Um, and so it is a, you know, it, and I remember back when that was being discussed, you know, the fact that it's officially designated as a feeder road, it sort of is what it is. So given that and given the potential for future development, that may be something to explore whatever form that takes. So um, I do, I do want to make sure I, as one of my other, one of my colleagues noted, uh, uh, commend the applicant for uh, reaching out to the land trust mm -hmm. and hopefully um, that will all come together if this goes uh, forward. So beyond that, um, hopefully that's useful for the applicant. Um, we, hopefully this was a good use of the time late this evening, and um, we can keep things moving. No, no thank you. Again, we don't, we don't want to belabor the point either. We appreciate your time. We appreciate everyone's right. very tired. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. We have a staff report. Yes, so I'll keep it brief. Um, just a reminder that we do have a workshop on the Downs on March 6th. Um, we have a meeting before then as well, but just want to, this is going to be outside our regular scheduled meeting. We sort of have it set up for about an hour and a half, and we'll try to uh, 
be conscious of that as we go through and see how we do. Um, also, just note that um, uh, the Downs folks are going to be doing a preliminary presentation, discussion, really discussion more with the council uh, next Wednesday, February 7th. Um, if any board members are interested, that's a workshop before their regular scheduled meeting. It's really sort of just a meet and greet introduction more than really mm -hmm. yes. Uh, Jay, I oh, have a quick sorry, question. I won't be able to. I would love to come to the workshop on the seventh, February right. next week. Um, gentlemen, can so, you take it outside? Sorry, folks. Um, we need to just wrap up our meeting. Thank you. Uh, I, I would love to come to that, but I'll yeah. be away. And I was just wondering about the format for the for the March workshop that we're having. Will we be given information a week or two ahead of time, like yes. we normally would for a planning board? Yep. So okay. uh, I started talking with their uh, with their representatives, and yeah, we anticipate sort of going through our typical three week submission okay. deadline. Okay. We're going to notify butters, but what I sort of see the layout being is more an open table and more of a discussion oh, rather than sort of the the board's typical sort of sitting in judgment. This is really sort of more discussion in terms of master planning and really having more of that open discussion. I love and it. So <laughs> no gavels allowed. Uh, so uh, okay. hopefully I, board members appreciate that approach. Um, we think that's really the way to have a master plan discussion. When we get into the details of a site plan subdivision, that's when we sort of need to do this more right. regulatory, right. judgmental uh, style. But, uh, <laughs> I, and as we saw, I mean, I thought it was a useful discussion when they were here um, last meeting. But as we saw, that we could easily spend a whole evening talking about that. So I think it makes a lot of sense to just break out an hour and a half to just focus purely on that. And I think, as a as a housekeeping note, the sixth is a Tuesday, Tuesday. I believe it is. Yep. Um, yep. I don't think we had any administrative amendments. Yes, no, sir. No. Planning board correspondence, we already noted uh, what we all received. Anything else to report? No. <coughs> Planning board comments, I'll just quickly note the next meeting, uh, just, uh, sorry, February 20th is a Tuesday because of the President's Day holiday. I'll also note that I will not be at that meeting, so Mr. McGee will be chairing that. Anything else? I would just like to ask. Um, I I really appreciate the you know getting everything delivered in our bags kind of a thing, but when we have um, uh, septic like large septic issues like this, I, I wouldn't mind getting copies of the groundwater analysis and test pit logs and things like that delivered in my our packages kind of a thing because those types of things are interesting to me. So, so those are just, so for what's for, I mean, that's why we have the Dropbox. That's where, so if you want something printed, I think if you give staff a call, we can facilitate that, but it's hard for us to know which, who wants a large landscape plan, who wants a set, it's Apparently a, Rick needs larger, I want a larger, larger font. Larger lighting <laughs> plan, a larger zoning font. So if there are, if you have particular needs, give us a call, send us a quick email, and we can run that stuff off. Thanks. We're happy to do that. So. Any other comments? Make a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. No discussion. That was my first one. Okay. Nice. Congratulations. <laughs> But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours off.